personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. I wonder if you remember the old-time comic who always began with, Tonight, the show's going to be different. And so it is with Let George Do It. Only we switched it to Tonight, the Mayhem's going to be different. And I want you to listen closely, as this would be a swell way to discourage your brother-in-law of taking your upper plate for the ladies' aid taffy pull. It has its beginning in a cozy little cave on Crescent Lane. You know the type. One of those modest country places with six rooms and a polo field. As our story opens, a nervous young filly is writing a letter to George Valentine. For this, she is using a very special pen. It not only writes underwater, it also writes under blood. Dear Claire, I meant to write you so much sooner than this. It's been so long, hasn't it? But has it only seemed that way to me because we're so isolated out here at Crescent Lane? Anyway, I've known, of course, that you'd be here for the weekend tomorrow, you and George, and I've... Oh, hello, Avery, dear. It's all right with you, isn't it, to have them here? I meant to tell you that I'd ask them, but I guess I forgot all about it and... With me, I think it's a terrific idea. But, but Joe... Who else would wander in to haunt you? You want to know how it is with Avery? You'd better ask him. Well, I... I... I thought you were Avery. Why, does he creep up on you, too? Well, I was just writing a letter, and I... Well, you see, I thought this George, this boyfriend of Claire Brooks, could go fishing this weekend. I mean, Avery loves a chance to show off his own trout lake, and... Well, it would take them a couple of days. Hey, this gets better and better. Go on, write your letter. I think it's a wonderful idea. With the squire out of the house for a couple of days... Cecile? Uh, yes, Avery? Oh, there's old Thunderhead. See you later, baby. I want my lunch now, Cecile. Oh, all right, Avery. I was just writing a letter to... Yes, yes, of course, but I'm in a hurry, dear. But I wanted to tell you, this weekend I've invited... I said I'm in a hurry, Cecile. Yes, Avery. What's the matter with you, anyway? Oh, nothing. Was Joe Ames here? Well, yes, but I... I don't like that man or his money, either. He doesn't belong in Crescent Lane. He's not the sort of well, man... Well, just because he wasn't born oh, here... Oh, for heaven's sakes, I want my lunch, I told you. Do I have to call one of the servants, or... All right, all right, I'll be right with you, dear. (laughs) That's the girl. That's my sister. I have to mail this in a hurry, Claire. But remember, I'm expecting you this weekend without fail. Sincerely, Cecile Lewis. This gal, Cecile, may have the whips, but she ain't so dumb. She figures by inviting Brooksy, Valentine's girl Friday, for the weekend, she will still have Joe Ames, her boyfriend, Monday. Wonder how the plan will set with Brother Avery, though. I bet not half so well as the plan my friend here has for you. My friend, I think you'll go far with that kind of talk. Now let's see how far Brooksy and George go when they get that letter from Cecile. Cecile Lewiston? I just don't know her. You don't know her. But then why would she write as though you were an old friend? I don't know. I tell you, I've never even heard of her. Uh Well, I've heard of an Avery Lewiston up there in Crescent Lane. Big shot among big shots. Sportsman stuff. You, too, can wear trees. I know. Wait a minute. Someplace in the paper here already. What? Yeah. Here it is. Yeah, society section. Where else? Oh, let's see. Prominent... Crescent Lane bachelor who will preside at the Hunt Club. That's him, all right. The early George Apley, mustache and all, distinguished looking... Look, George, there she is. Huh? There, holding the bridle of the horse in the background. Oh, yeah. Miss Cecile Lewiston. She's not very attractive, is she? But she writes as though you were a friend. All right, come on, Angel. Let's find out why. I'm so glad you could come. It's certainly a beautiful place, all your gardens and the woods. 
But I'd still like to know Oh, yes, my brother's very proud of it. Well, aren't you too, Cecile? Well, it's really his. I mean, I've always lived here. Ever since my mother and father died, I I was just a child. But my brother is... Well, it's sort of his. I always think of it that way. Here, we'll go in through here. Well, wait a minute. Uh, What about that letter of yours? Mr. Valentine, please don't ask any questions. (laughs) You might as well ask him to stop breathing. Uh, I'll explain everything later. No, 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 no. It's all right with me. What? No questions. Thank you. Come on. All right. But you've told your brother we were all friends of yours. Mr. Valentine, you promised Now, that's not a question. Just an observation. And you wrote the letter to Brooksy that way because he was watching you write it, maybe. So that makes your brother a curious kind of duck who looks over shoulders. No. No, I I mean... All right, all right. Never mind. I'm close enough. But why a full-grown woman would pull a childish stunt like that on her brother is but beyond me. But you're wrong. I mean, Avery doesn't even know about you yet. I haven't had a chance to tell him. He was out all yesterday afternoon with a man named Joe Ames, who's new here, and, well, this morning Hold I... Him. Well, hello. Hi, hi. We were just admiring your place. Oh, but... no. No, this is not Avery. I mean, this is Paul Merrill. Miss Brooks, Mr. Valentine, oh, how do you do? Oh, I'm sorry. Paul lives down the road. What do you want, Paul? If you're looking for Joe, he hasn't been by here this morning. Well, why do I want him? Oh, I'm all through with Joe Ames. Why, what do you mean? Well, he got what he came here for, didn't he? The big tycoon with social ambitions. He's made the grade now. What's this? Huh? Oh, hi, Avery. Well, where are you? Right here in the study window. Oh. But what did you just say about... No, no, operator. Hang on a minute, will you? Well, it was nothing important. Uh, uh, go on, go on, finish your phone call. We'll walk around the porch and come inside. Avery, these are some friends Be of... Be quiet, the... will you? Shut up. What? Avery! Nice guy. You know why Ames has been here to see you. You stay out of this. Yes, Avery. Well, all I meant and was... And you don't know. Goodbye. What do you think it is, Paul? Oh, Avery, for gosh sakes, Joe Ames just bought my place, that's all. In what? Well, sure, I... I dropped by, I thought you might be interested. Yeah, now, Joe's made the grade, house in Crescent Lane... He bought up my second mortgage without telling anybody. <laughs> sort of had me over a barrel. What else could I do? Oh, I, I haven't signed any papers yet, but... Oh, uh, what's the difference? Who cares? I can't pay the taxes by just growing peaches and... I... Well, Avery, Avery, hey! Well, well, what the heck's the matter with him? Paul, please leave us alone. Hmm? Get out of here, will you? Please, Paul, please. Well, sure, sure, take it easy. What the... Please, everybody always upset all the time. Well, I'll I'll see you later. Ames, Paul Merrill, hot tempers, social climbers, what kind of a thing is Mr. Valentine, something's wrong with my brother. I don't know what it is, but he's been like this for weeks. Just any little thing will set him off. I mean, he doesn't care about Paul Merrill selling his property any more than I do. That's what I wanted you to do this weekend. Take him fishing, make him get away from here. Well, Avery hasn't left this place for years, not even for horse shows out of town. Hey, hey, slow down, will you? Tell Brooksy, not me. Oh, Mr. Valentine. Don't mind if I climb in the window, do you? I want to make a phone call. George, what are you talking about? A guy has to be pretty upset to just drop a phone without hanging it up. Oh. Hello, hello. Hello, operator. Do I still want to talk to police headquarters? No, no, never mind, thank you. Hmm. Police headquarters? Cecile, why would your brother be talking to... Cecile. George, she's gone. Yeah. Listen. Hey, five shots. Sounds like it's over in one of those sheds. Stay here, Brooksy. Well, it's you. Hello, Avery. My name's George Valentine. What have you got here? Miniature rifle range? Get out of here. <laughs> a man gets upset, he can come out and plug away at a sandbag, huh? It's a repair shed. I haven't been here for months, but the door is always open. Yes. There's no lock. What's that? Mr. Valentine. I know who you are. I know why you're here. There's something wrong with me, isn't there? My poor little sister... That I've given half my life to. She's so normal, so honest. Hey, hey, take it. But she's going to run away from me. Did she tell you that? Did she? There's a man named Ames. You see, and I... What's this? What's this? No, I know. It's all very confusing. But it's really not. Cecile is stupid. She's not pretty. She's never had a man like that make a play for her. Ames, Joe, Ames. Rough and ready. Man of ambition. 
would have to be accepted around here if he married a Lewiston. Only, of course, I'd never allow it. Would I? Oh, clear it up, please, Buster. What are you talking about? A moment about? ago, I got the idea. It hit me like a sledgehammer. Elope. That's what I've been afraid Ames would try. Elope with her so I couldn't stop it. And that's why you're here, to get me out of the way. Well, it might make a little sense. Your sister certainly hasn't so far. And neither have I. Because now I know I'm wrong, you see. Hey, move, will you? Stand over there. Ah. Because somebody else has been in this shed. And so has my rifle. Look, slug in the waste box. See? Oh, now, look, how about one thing at a time? That's what I'm doing. Someone's packed a rifle bullet into a shotgun shell. He could dig the rifle slug out of the sandbag I there. still don't get it. Let me see. Look it. out, I'll spill sand all over you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here's a slug from your rifle. Another couple. Three of them in the sandbag, but... They match with the one in the waste box, see? Look at it. And here. The one in the shotgun shell. Now, wait a minute, Buster. Let me get this straight. You're talking about being upset over your sister, but now you've got a shotgun shell loaded with what's left of a rifle bullet. Listen to me. I don't understand it. I just found it. Ames. I've been worried about Ames making a play for my sister. Wanting to take her away, yes. Of course, I've been behaving strangely. But now I find a thing like this. Uh-huh. Somebody's been experimenting with your ammunition. I don't know what it means. Well, here. Might mess up the barrel of this shotgun a little, but we'll try. What are you going to do? Well, I've heard of taking the buckshot out of a shotgun shell and stuffing something heavier in front of the powder. Look out! Well, that one wasn't packed very tight. But see? There's the slug over there, buried in the wall. The slug that was originally fired from your rifle. George! George, where are you? Oh, yeah, and here, Brooksy. Don't tell anyone. It, it doesn't make any sense. I, I don't understand it. It, it doesn't make... I think you better come inside. Why? We've got a big enough mystery cooking right in here. Oh, George, listen. The caretaker's on the phone from the next estate. He says he was out in the woods and found the body of a man with a bullet in him. What? What's that? It was the body of Joe Ames. You know, this piece of news is going to come as a big shock to Cecile. Here she was, all ready to marry Ames, and he often elopes with an angel. Poor girl. In her present mental state, she's liable to toss convention to the winds and get on her broom and join him. However, here's a fellow who doesn't need a broom to take a flyer. He does it with word. Sweep a syllable this way, pal. <laughs> You remember the old saying, never go for a tramp in the woods unless you're wearing a bulletproof vest. Well, Joe Ames didn't. He went looking for a partridge and turned out to be the pigeon. Now, this made Brother Avery a happy little monster, as his cup ran over even at the mention of Ames. All of this came to pass just because George and Brooksy got a weekend bid from Cecile, a hysterical female who's just itching for a jacket that buttons down the back. Two minutes in these surroundings would have told anybody to get your bustle back to town. But not our George. He took a shot in the dark and stayed. Meanwhile, someone took a shot in the woods and didn't. Was it murder? Was it suicide? I don't know. Mr. Worth, the local constable, thinks it was an accident. Uh, how about you, Brooksy? Avery Lewiston made some sort of a phone call to the police or was going to earlier, remember, George? I already asked Mr. Worth about that, Angel. Yeah, Avery's been pestering us trying to find out all the facts about this Joe Ames, that's about all. Yeah, that's what he told me, too. What do you mean, facts about Joe Ames? Well, Ames has made a lot of money back east, you see. I guess Avery hoped somebody would tell him Ames was crooked. But Ames wasn't, huh? Oh, no, 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 of course not. You know, just a bit rough, ambitious. I don't know why Avery should have worried so much about it. He's got plenty. Nothing Ames could have done to him except to bring a little noise and progress into his precious crescent lane. Oh, no, no, there was something else, his sister. What? Uh, skip it, it's all over. Uh, by the way, Valentine, I want you to show me this hocus-pocus out in the shed. This shotgun rifle slug stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll get Avery. Yeah, that's what I mean. Let's clear it up. Let 
That's it. That's what I found. Understand, Mr. Worth. That somebody's been experimenting with how to fire a rifle slug out of a shotgun? Well, of course I do. Only tell me, Avery, where do you keep your rifle? Well, generally in my study inside the house. So your rifle itself couldn't very well be borrowed and then put back without your noticing it? I suppose not. But the slugs fired from it could? I don't understand. I think I do. Go on, Worth. What was it your crew reported to you from town? Uh, where's your rifle now, Avery? Well, I had it out here earlier with Mr. Valentine, but... No, it... it's gone. Yeah, that's right. My boys have it. They ran a ballistics check, Valentine. The bullet that killed Joe Ames was fired from Avery's rifle. Well, I'll see you later. What? Uh, but, but wait a minute. Somebody trying to build you a noose, Avery? <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm finally beginning to understand. I thought I was a well-liked person. In fact, for years, I've been sort of an ex-officio mayor of Crescent Lane. Take it easy. But now it seems someone would like me to hang. Why? Just because I'm known to express my opinion on Ames? Because I would make an obvious suspect? Easy now. Worth is going to comb the woods for a shotgun. Try and check everyone in the neighborhood that might have been fired. He figures whoever practiced stuffing shells in here is the one who did it. But the slug was from my gun. It had the telltale markings from the barrel of my rifle. So when he finds that everyone disliked Ames, it'll be much easier to put the handcuffs on me. Oh, cut it out, will you please? Why? Don't you understand? How will we ever be able to prove that the bullet that killed Ames had already been fired once by me in here? Sometimes a crime is simpler than it looks. You said everybody hated Ames. But everybody didn't have access to the shed, did they? No. No, that's right. Oh. Uh, hello? Paul. Hello, Paul. I just wondered if there was anything I could do. No. No, I guess not. Uh, Mr. Merrill, you live down the road, don't you? Yeah, that's right. Yes, all is I. I suppose the police have asked you where you were this morning. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have any alibis, if that's what you mean. Yeah, but on the other hand, I don't kill people. Hey, you fixed this place up pretty nice, Avery. Moving the lathe out gave you more room in here, didn't it? Haven't you been in here since then? Me? Well, no, why would I? Now, what's going on, anyway? I'm not interested in guns, if that's what you mean. But you're a neighbor. You're around here all the time. Well, now, let's get it clear. What do you mean? No, no, Valentine. It's ridiculous. Paul and I have nothing in common. As for my sister, she actually goes out of her way to avoid me. There must be others. I was thinking that Mr. Merrill and Joe Ames had something in common, that's all. What's that? Yeah, that uh, business of the property. Oh. Oh, now, 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 look here. He forced me to sell. What of it? I don't mind getting out of here. I've been full of Crescent Lane all my life, and I'm sick of it. Well, just because he didn't give me as much money as... No, oh, I'm getting out of here. I I'm sorry, I can't help you, Valentine. Paul. No, I'll let him go, Avery. It's about all over anyway. Uh what? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes a crime can be so simple. And the simple way is the only way I can figure it. Well, well where are you going? Oh, what do you mean that it... To see an old friend that I didn't meet until today. Your sister, Avery. No, Mr. Valentine... Please leave me alone. Please. Now, look, you lied to begin with when you wrote us your letter. And if you don't help me now... But Joe Ames was an awful man. Don't you see? Anyone could have done it. An awful man? Ames has been around here for months, hasn't he? He wanted to buy some property. But even more than that, he wanted to marry you. George? Here, Brooksy, what'd you find? Wh what have you been doing back there? I was in your room, Cecile. I had to go through the bathroom. The other door was locked. You have no right to... Well, if you won't tell us, we'll find out ourselves. Go ahead, Brooksy. She had three suitcases, all packed. Oh. There isn't anything left in the closet but a few things to wear over the weekend. No. No, Okay, I... so you were planning to get out of here. That is why you brought us out here, isn't it? To get your brother out of the way so you could leave. You must be scared to death of Avery. No, no, I'm not. It's just that... I know, I know. He didn't want you to get married. But I wasn't going to be married. You don't understand... This is your engagement ring, isn't it? I found it in your dressing table. <laughs> okay, Cecile, Okay. <laughs> Avery had already guessed it. He told me about it. Now, you tell us about it. No. No, I won't. 
I can't. You're protecting someone, aren't you? No, no, I'm not. Someone like yourself. What? Ames was murdered by a bullet from your brother's rifle. Avery? Avery, come in here. Oh, no, never mind him. He couldn't have been the one to try and frame himself. Don't you understand? So it's someone else you're protecting? No. Oh, leave me alone. Oh, come on, Cecile. Let's go into town. What? George, she's so upset she's sick. The person she's protecting is Cecile. How many times do I have to say it? George. Well, who else would have access not only to that shed out there, but also to the study where Avery kept his rifle? Mr... Mr. Valentine. Oh, come on, sister. You can tell it to Mr. Worth at police headquarters. George, look out. She's... Oh, yeah, I've got her. Oh, she just fainted, that's all. What is it? What happened? Oh, nothing. Brooksy, get on the phone. Call Worth. Tell him I'm on my way. All right, George. Then wait here for me. What are you doing with her? Cecile. She fainted, that's all. Never mind, I can get the door. Put her down. Valentine. She'll be taken care of. Don't worry. Put her down, I said. I have. There's a doctor in jail. He can take... Get away from her! Will George get away from her? Will Avery give it to him in the end? Boy, doesn't a situation like this kind of get you deep down inside? Huh? well, in case it didn't, maybe what my friend here has to say will. Let's get back and see how George is making out. Say, this is terrible. He's still standing there. Get away from her! Well, where did you get the shotgun? Merrill, found it out in the woods. Just bringing it to show you. Well, don't wave it at me like that. Uh, What's that shotgun loaded with? Buckshot? You better get your hand off the trigger. You'll hit us both. What? Or is it loaded with another one of those five slugs from the shed? You went over to Merrill's and you stole his rifle and now you're getting ready to plant it in the woods. Get away from her. Oh, yeah, sure. The big squire of Crescent Lane that everybody calls Thunderhead. And the only person that really takes you seriously, I guess, is Cecile. After all, why not? She's not very good looking. There weren't any boys. She's waited on you hand and foot ever since your parents Stop died. Stop it. Be quiet. What makes you think I'd want to plant Merrill's gun? Now, you listen to me, Buster. You move one inch and she gets hurt, see? The gun's Simple. The whole crime's simple, I told you. I always wondered what it'd be like to walk in on a case just a few minutes after a man had been murdered. Now I know. A man'll try anything when he's desperate, won't he? I don't know what you're talking about. All right, forget all the fancy stuff. Forget that shotgun stuff. When I walked in here today, you were phoning the police. You were all upset. Well, suppose you were going to phone in and tell him that you just shot a man by accident in the woods. No, that's not true. He was the guy who was going to take your sister away from you. With your standing around here, how could anybody ever prove it wasn't an accident? But the shotgun... You shot Ames with your rifle. Only then you changed your mind. How desperate can you get? Sure, why not make it a murder now? For the last time, Valentine, I'm warning why you... Why not get rid of Merrill, too? Why not go out to the shed and show me a perfectly obvious switch with the ammunition that'd make you look innocent forever? But I found those shells there. You knew ballistics had proved it was your rifle that killed Ames, so you showed me how someone else could have used one of those five slugs... For the last time, get away from... Five slugs, Buster. Five slugs. You ripped open the sandbag, remember? There were three in there. One in the wastebasket. One in the shotgun shell you just stuffed. I don't even know what you're talking but about. But I heard you fire your rifle five times. So why weren't there more slugs? If somebody else was getting them from an earlier shooting out there, he'd have to get them out of the sandbag, wouldn't he? But the bag wasn't ripped open. And when it was, we only found three. Valentine. Five slugs, and you fired five shots. Now drop that gun. Uh. Oh, Mr. Valentine, I, I knew he must have done it. But I couldn't tell you what I knew. I couldn't. All right, all right. Take it easy, Cecile. Your brother's a strange guy. I guess you know that better than anyone else. But you don't need to explain anything. Not even why he suddenly decided to make his simple crime look like a murder. He made quite a mistake, didn't he? Mistake? George, what do you mean? Haven't you figured that out, Angel? Well, come on, I'll tell you on the way out. (laughs) 
All right, think, Brooksy. Why didn't he just leave Ames' death as an accident? Why didn't he finish his call to the police? You remember what happened? Well, Paul Merrill was there talking about selling his property. Angel Cecile was planning to elope. Now, would the man she'd elope with buy property right near the murderous brother they were running away from? Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's what hit Avery like a sledgehammer. But on the other hand, why would Merrill be perfectly willing to sell at a bad price and get out? Now you have it. But she and Merrill were so cool toward each other. Well, if it was necessary to elope, it'd also be necessary to put on an act, wouldn't it? Avery never even guessed until that moment. It wasn't Ames at all. It was Merrill. And Avery started working to pin the murder on Merrill. Sure, sure. Get rid of the real suitor who was going to steal his sister. But at least it ends happily. You see, now they can get together. <laughs> Love always wins out. Ha. Huh. You know, it's amazing to me how Valentine can romp his way through a million clues and then top it off by saying the wrong thing to Brooksy. That poor gal's got enough frustrations for a sorority house. Oh, well, time will tell. And I've got just enough time to tell you that Robert Bailey plays George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, and Eddie Dunstetter gave you a shot or two at the organ. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. I wonder if you know who first said, let George do it. Now, if your name happens to be George, don't say my wife, because you'll be wrong. No, it was all started back in the 15th century by a fellow named Louis XII, who must have been a pretty stale character, because unlike his grandson, Louis XIV, he didn't have any furniture named after him. You see, back in those days, it wasn't considered fashionable for a king to go around stabbing people in the back. So as a result, when some peasant got out of line, he called in George, a fellow with a sharp knife and no scruples. Now, I don't mean to say that George Valentine employs the same tactics, but if you hire him to do a job, he expects you to look the other way if someone starts to bleed. All of which brings us up to the moment whereby George is about to get himself hired by a group of evil politicians. If you'll shut the door, we can put the plot on to boil. Boys are a little noisy. Yes, the luncheon's broke up. <laughs> Civically. Just a lot of talk. None of them will ever do anything but the three of us. Always away, you're not. I don't know. You've only written one sentence. Shut up, Vic. And summer, spring. Um, perhaps you visited the hotel here yourself, Mr. Valentine, but at least it's a sure thing you've seen the outrageous charges the federal grand jury and city newspapers have been making about uh, us. Now, now, wait a minute, Nielsen. I'm still not so sure this is the right way to go at this. Here, here. The mayor speaks. Well, now, Vic, you're a lawyer. Would you hire a man you've never seen to investigate your own backyard? Now, there's a man I know, a fine detective, who would be only too glad to come down fine here. Fine detective like that police force of yours, I suppose. Can't see what's under their own noses. Well, I'm the responsible one, and it seems to me that and I that should be... that wall, his back's to the wall, and his head is all full of surmises. Now, You've see here, You've got Vic, to you... stop being cautious sometime, Emmett. In my bank, I make decisions, and I make them fast. Yes, but I'd I rather... agree with Nielsen, Emmett. If we don't get an outside investigator quick, the grand jury will do it. I say let's us find out first. Clean up our own town. <laughs> Objections overruled. Now we're getting someplace. Mr. Valentine, I'm enclosing railroad tickets. A public-spirited group of which I am the head. Three of us. Don't we sound fancy, though? 
expects your immediate presence. It has been alleged that Summer Springs is being used as the center of payoffs for the big city collection racket. That our fair town has a jackal in its midst. And it's your job to find him. There. I do it? Oh, yeah. all right. Now we'll get some action. I'll mail this right now. Only, see here, both of you. Nobody knows about this but the three of us. Remember, nobody else knows about Valentine. That's what I call a happy little trio. I wouldn't trust that mayor any farther than I could toss the city hall, which ain't far. On the other hand, here's something you can put your faith in and never be wrong. Well, I guess George got the tickets all right, because there he is at the railroad station. The gorgeous one with him, uh, that's Brooksy. She works for Valentine when he hasn't got anything else to do. They made a reservation for me at the Summer Springs Hotel, Brooks, so you can phone me up there. George, why can't I go with you? Just because they don't expect Look, me to come... Look, it's a five-alarm to... fire all set to go off, and you know it. Summer Springs is going to be hotter than but the... But nobody fog. knows about you, just the men who rose. Angel, I'm looking for a guy who poses as respectable, a big-timer who hasn't been identified. And if you were there, I wouldn't be able to duck as fast But there's nothing to. dangerous if nobody oh, knows. Hey, wait, Mr. Valentine. Huh? Yeah? Well, the baggage man pointed you up. Yeah? I need your help. I need you a lot. I got a case for you. Sorry, I'm tied up on one. My, uh, grandmother is dead. Oh, that's too bad. My grandfather killed her. Used an axe. What? I'm not interested. George. You see, my aunt's insane and what happened I doubt if the... you ever had a grandmother, gorilla boy, or even a mother. Now say it in English and fast, because I'm not going to miss that train. I got a thousand bucks here for you to take my case. I could think of one. Uh-huh. You mean if I don't take the train? I don't mind. I can tell it to you on the way to Summer Springs. That's where you think I'm going, huh? No, just where you think you're going. So somebody else does know. Hey, Buster, get out of my way before oh, I miss stay that. away, I'm telling you. Oh, no, you George, don't. George, look, look out! out. No. Yeah, yeah, easy. We're attracting attention. A corpse would attract more. Who hired you? A thousand bucks. The trip ain't necessary. Stay home. Okay. Okay, maybe you're right, mister. Too late now, anyway. There she goes. It's a sunny kind of a trip. You wouldn't have enjoyed it. Uh-huh. Shall we go count the money? Sure. My name's Lemuel. You're a smart guy. I thought you'd see the light. Yeah. I hope you do. So you get to go after all, Angel. Yeah, you get to drop me off in Summer Springs yourself. From the car. Not much of a hotel, is it? For a fancy town like this, no more potted palms than usual. Do I get to come in with you? Sure, sure. Lemuel kept me off the train, didn't he? Okay, then the more casual, the better. You mean whoever hired him won't be expecting you to show up now? I mean, Lemuel isn't in My condition to report fellow, for a while. I do not care what the union says about chambermaids. I have an opinion, too, you know. Have you been a clerk for 12 years? Well, have you? Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. Be just a moment. Oh, no, no, no. Finish the phone call. Now, listen. I don't care how many chambermaids you've known. Do you run a laundry service or a... or a... Oh, hold on, will you? I'm so sorry. Now, what was it... George you... Valentine. I've got a reservation. No, I won't call the manager. He doesn't live here. Uh, what was the name, sir? George Valentine. Oh, let me see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, he's in his room. He... What? At 350 towels, I told you. Not 340. Oh, for heaven's sake, hang on, will you? What's the matter? Well, I asked... If... Oh, yes, 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 it was George Valentine you asked for, wasn't it? Well, he just checked in a few moments ago. Yes, yeah, he's in his room. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. It's room 419. It's elevated to the right. Um, but... Oh, uh, thanks is... a lot, Buster. Come on, Angel. You see, my dear fellow, if the chambermaids don't count the towels every day... Who is it, George? 
if somebody took your oh, room... Oh, I don't know, Brooksy. Looks like they're still one step ahead of us, whoever they are. It's essential Emuel couldn't have revived in time. Well, whoever the impersonator is in there, he doesn't seem to answer very fast. Come on. <gasps> yeah, sure. Of course he's dead. They shut that door. There's no gun. I don't shut see a gun. Shut the door, will you? Uh-huh. He's shot, all right. George, he's about your same bill. Huh? Around the same age. Yeah. It is a briefcase over here under the bed. It's a sample case, isn't it? The kind salesmen carry? Neckties. Nothing but neckties. Look, George, there's a key on the floor next to it. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, to another room, 631. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Card in his wallet. Sure, of course. Harold Stark, Sure Silk Tie Company from Salt Lake City. Necktie salesman. Only well, suppose he came in on the train tonight, George. Uh-huh, yeah, sure. Single guy looking generally my type. You mean suppose he got picked up by somebody watching the hotel here, somebody expecting me. So they kill him and put him in your Wait a minute, room? wait a minute. Let it ring. We ought to talk to the clerk, to the bellboys. Now listen, whoever shot this guy did it and ran. Okay, then so will we. George, that's crazy. Is it? I was hired to find out who a big-time collection man is in this town, right? Only whoever it is got one jump ahead of us. I can't even start working until I get out from behind the eight ball, can I? Oh, George, that phone, it keeps ringing. Somebody's going to hear it. And... What are you doing? I'm putting my wallet, my own wallet, on the body. What do you think? No. You take this guy's. Go back to that drive-in on the edge of town. Run a fast telephone check on him. Harold Stark, Salt Lake City. The clerk knows we're here. He'll keep ringing. Wait like I grab the neckties. We'll dump him in the alley. And I'll be out from behind the eight ball if I'm dead, won't I? George. I'll be free to find out those guys who hired me. So come on, give the police a chance to find the body of George Valentine. Yes, come in, Mr. Uh, uh. Valentine, I told you. Your name is Nielsen, isn't it? You sent for me, didn't you? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, of course. Well, don't look like a ghost, like you're scared. What do you want with me? What's that? Why do you keep your hand in your pocket? Because I want a cigarette. What? See? Oh. Now all I want is a little talk, Mr. Nielsen, with you and Mr. Vickery and Emmett Wall, the mayor. You know all of our names. Well, sure, of course. Here's the letter you wrote me. Oh, <laughs> hey, I'm beginning to get this. Have you just had a phone call or something? Yes, I have, as a matter of fact, from Vickery. He happened to be at police court. For once, they worked fast in this town. A patrolman has reported the murder of George Valentine. <laughs> okay, sit down. I'll explain if you will. I have nothing to... Buster, I'll use your phone. Prove it to you. The police here in the city... I know you've never seen my face, but they can identify my voice for you. Here, let me have it. Oh, no. Hello? George? Oh, yeah. What'd you find out, Brooksy? I found out that you're crazy. Absolutely crazy. What? Darling, I tried to contact those people in Salt Lake, but I can't. I mean, I got the company all right, but nothing about Harold Starr. Why not? They've never even heard of him. Nobody by that name has ever sold neckties. Don't you see what you've done? Throw away that wallet, George. The man who was killed was a phony. You can't be somebody that doesn't exist. All right. I believe you. I agree you're Valentine. Then you realize how fast I gotta work, Nielsen. I told you what Miss Brooks said. The body was a plant of some kind. This thing gets deeper every minute. And you haven't even started your investigation. Whoever the man is I'm after is calling the shots in advance. And you claimed only three of you knew about me. Yes, yes, I understand. You think it's one of us. But I'm afraid it doesn't make much difference if I do help you now. What do you mean by that? Well, Mr. Valentine, I'm not a cowardly man. But I'll admit, when you knocked on the door... Yeah, sure, you were scared to death. What's that got to do with... Valentine, I don't think you realize yet just how far behind that eight ball you are. That same patrolman who found the body also saw a man and woman throw away a briefcase in an alley. Huh? You and Miss Brooks, there was identification with the neckties. At the door just now, I thought you were the man every policeman in town is looking for. Harold Stark. He doesn't exist, you say? <laughs> His description is yours. And you know who you are? Never mind, never mind. I get it. I dug my own grave, didn't I? Yeah. I killed George Valentine. Well, 
this should prove something, but nothing's impossible. Who else do you know can bump themselves off and live to tell you how it felt? I think George is wasting his talents in summer springs. This boy should be in Washington. They could use him, just like you should hear this. I don't know if you've been able to follow this little story up to now, so in case you haven't, don't let what I have to say confuse you, because it will. It seems that a group calling themselves the Syndicate figures the politicians in the town of Summer Springs as fall guys for their nefarious deeds. Now, the mayor of said hamlet does not look kindly on this plot, as he figures that he's committed enough crimes already to go around. So what does he do? He writes George Valentine. And what does he do? He bumps himself off, which is getting out of it the easy way, which the mayor does not like and tells himself. Well, Valentine, for once it seems the police wasted no time discovering a mistake, that George Valentine was not killed. Well, that's nice to know. You mean they re-identified that body I found? Clarence Prell up-and-coming accountant. His name's been mixed up in this thing already. He's been making a tremendous amount of money the past few years. It's just possible our big shot is already dead. Well, why would this man, this accountant, have the identification of Harold Stark on him? Who killed him? Who put it there? Who put him there in my hotel room? Now, listen to me, Valentine. You can get to work now. You're off the hook. They know it's not your body. Now, look, I've been in trouble because it wasn't kept secret that you three were hiring me. Is that right? Oh, there you go again. We're honest. Stupid? Yes, but honest. None of us are mixed up in any rackets. Okay, okay, skip it. But even if the big shot isn't one of you, you're now in the way, aren't you? What? Well, maybe I'm wanted by the police, but if the killer with strong boys knows about me, he also then knows about you. Yeah. Lock your doors tonight. Shh. Turn out those lights. Huh? car just stopped out there. I could see the lights blinking. <laughs> Take it easy, Nielsen. It's only Miss Brooks. I'll see you later. Oh, George, sometimes I think you're the eight ball. Angel, the heat's on the big shot, whoever he is, a lot more than it's on me. Come on, we're going in here. Yeah, the drugstore? Yeah. Got a nickel in your purse? Yeah. Why don't you go straight to the mayor himself? Brooksy, I need a little more time to work alone. You're going to give it to me. What? The mayor's got his own ideas. I've got mine. But if, if I don't work fast, a lot of people are liable to get hurt. This... Hello, operator. I want a policeman. This Mr. Rex will do anything to cover his tracks before a full investigation... George, what on earth are you doing? Hey, police, look. I just heard that thing on the radio. I, I mean that description of that guy and that girl, that, that Harold Stark with the girl who was dressed... Well, slow down. How can I? I just seen her, the girl, having a soda. And... Hey, what's the name here? Oh, yeah. Kleshima's Drugstore. She's wearing you a... rat. A you brown coat. Hey, you better down. come and get it quick. George Valentine, of At all the dirty tricks. At least you won't get hurt, Angel. Tell him to look for me any place but the Summer Springs Hotel, room 631. Now, you play eight ball for a while. Six thirty-one. Key fits all right. Ouch! Where are the lights in this point? Oh no! How long have you been dead, Baldy? Huh. Just about as long as the other guy, I guess, huh? Only what's your name? Are you the real Harold Stark? Are you the? Hey! Oh! Shut up. People in the next room. Hey. Lemuel. Yeah. It's a lousy hotel to let anybody in. I thought I knocked you out of the picture before once. We're even. I didn't hit you hard enough either. Yeah, you're out of condition, Buster. That's bad. You kill that guy? 
I was with you in another town. Don't talk so loud. All right, all right. Hey, wait a minute. What are you trying to... Hey, get out of my pocket. What's the idea? There's a gun in your stomach. Don't argue. Well, why put a gun in my pocket, too? It's empty. I'll get your hopes up. Be quiet. Another wallet, too. If you think you can frame me for killing this guy, whoever he is, you're crazy. I'm not. Cops don't kill cops. What? Can't you tell Flat Feet when you see him his name's Harold Stark? And I that got shot. Like you're gonna be. Oh, so that's it. Yeah, sure, there is a Stark, a detective. Came to town acting like a necktie salesman, huh? Ouch. Just let me get in that chair, would you? Sure. You're fixed. You got everything. Wait a minute. Two guns. Two guns I got in my pocket. That's a lot. There's two men dead, aren't there? You're a bright boy, a real up-and-coming eye. Dead eye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. The real Stark dead in this room. That accountant named Prell dead in my room. So come on, bright boy, get on your feet. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Look out. Get away from that phone. Hello, anybody. No. <laughs> Now shut up, like I said. Hey, what's going on there? Can people have no privacy? You're listening. That's what you're doing. Oh, for the love of... Walk, will you? Go on the door. All right, all right. Plenty of standing room. Don't shove. Well, what are you listening to? You think you hear something or something? Of all the mirrors. Now out the door. Okay, okay. Just thought you might not want the guy who's coming down the hall to see you. What? Oh, it's only the desk clerk. Get back in there. What's going on here? What in the hell is that? What do you think you're doing? Come on, get out of the way. Fast. Let go of me. Really? Down here, will you? Okay, he's not going to shoot. Shoot? What kind of a disturbance is this? This is not the sort of hotel you get... Wait a minute. I've seen you before. Yeah, you're the guy who gave out my description. What? No, no, I didn't give any description. Oh, you're the laundry man. Oh, no. No, that's what I was talking about. I remember. You're the... Oh. oh. Well, see here. There was a mix-up Come on, on skip it. Just show me the fastest way out. Don't... Get that gun away from that me. That big man in there. Was there anybody with him when he came into the hotel? What? Well, no. No. Oh. Yes, I... I mean, yes. Uh, uh, there are several men down the lobby. I... I don't know who they are. You're wanted by the police. That, that's all I know. The back stairs, then. Where are they? Come on. I won't help a criminal. Come on, don't argue, friend. Well, all right. Here. Here, here duck in here. Uh, there, there are several policemen in the hotel, too. There, there are cars at the alley entrance. You're going to find me a way out, so stop shaking. I didn't kill anybody. The police don't think I did. Why not? Now, look, you. I'm just a guy behind the eight ball, see? There's a big crook in your town, Clarence Prell. You know him? No. An accountant. Man in a nice spot to take payoffs coming in from the city. But Prell is dead, so he's not the crook. What? Oh, for heaven's Find sake. Find me a way out of here or people will be wrong. They'll think he was the crook. They'll say he killed a detective named Harold Stark who was on his trail. Let them say what they want. I... They'll say I killed Prell, maybe in self-defense. But I was real smart and collected all the evidence, including the guns. Then poor Valentine. He was on his way to get himself out of trouble with the police when something happened to him. You're mad. You're worse than the laundry people. Now, look, Buster, I'm telling you all this so you'll help. It's a frame-up, see? To get rid of two private detectives and take the heat off by making Prell look like the big shot. A triple play. Uh, here we are. Here. Uh, give me a hand with the window. Ah, okay. Only six stories up. I forgot my umbrella. I can't jump, Buster. No, 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 no. Look, out there, you see, ah. to the side. It's an old fire escape. It hasn't been used since we built the new wing, but it comes down in the service yard. This is the side street. Yeah. You, well, go on. How much help do you need? Oh, <laughs> there's no one down there. Here, you see? Yeah. Yeah, sure, I see. Uh-huh. Little rusty, though, isn't it? Well, what do you expect? A red carpet? I expect you to go first. Lead the way. What? It just occurred to me it's not so bad being behind an eight ball. If you've got the cue in your hand. Mr. Valentine, for the love of... Remember the gun, Buster. Lead the way. Now, tell me. Why do you call me Valentine? Why not Prell or Stark? 
Or any of the other names thrown around tonight? Well, well, back there, Lemuel called you Valentine. How do you know his name? Well, I'm a hotel clerk. I, I see lots of people. And that switchover of rooms today. I don't see how anybody could have done it but the hotel clerk himself. Well, but what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> Human nature. How you and your boy Lemuel found out about my coming here. How I? An accountant sees lots of people, sure. But a hotel clerk sees a lot more. Now, who's in a better spot to receive payoff deliveries on the QT than the man behind the desk? I'm going back. You're going nowhere. Now, listen, Buster. It had to either be one of my three clients or you. What? Yeah, so take human nature again. It couldn't be one of them, or why get me in it? But they did write the letter right after a Civic League luncheon. Uh, what do you mean, human nature? I mean how people mail letters in hotels. In a hotel, you just hand the letter to the clerk to mail, don't you? Get out of my way. Oh, no, you don't. I'm going back. What's the matter? Don't these rusty stairs go on down there? Do they just fall off in the dark someplace? That's you who's going to fall off in the dark. Not even afraid of the gun, are you? You already know it's not loaded. Just evidence to be found on the patsy. Look out. Don't. This is where you get racked up, eight ball. No, I don't think that was very nice of George. He gave Buster time to open everything but his parachute. While we're waiting for the desk clerk to make a three-point landing, here are a couple of good points for you. But, George, how did you get off that fire escape? It was rusty. You would have fallen through. That's why he led you out there. What he expected hey, you to do hey, was... Hey, 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 slow down, will you? How'd you get out of jail, Angel? Oh, George, please, I want to understand. Oh, he was a guy, all right, the hotel clerk. Yeah, he kept a job so nobody would ever guess, as well as because it was such a perfect spot for payoffs. He knew the heat was on when he heard I was coming, and Lemuel couldn't stop me. He had me all set for a double fancy frame. But that other detective... Well, the mayor said he wanted to handle things himself, didn't he? Did he know a man he wanted to hire? Harold Stark. Posing as a necktie salesman. Yeah, and that accountant had been working with a clerk on the rackets, so he figured he'd make him fall guy. Strictly from desperation, Angel. But it all might have worked. But you would have died accidentally, fallen and been killed, and that would have been the end of it. Mm -hmm. Only how on earth, after you knocked him out, how did you get him off the fire escape? <laughs> how did you get out of jail? Well, you saw him. That big, good-looking policeman. So what? You said you didn't tell him anything. No. Well? <laughs> he was very sweet. Well, he... I mean, after a while, there was no reason to hold me. In jail, I mean. Oh, why, Brooksy. And... Well, why should I tell you if you won't tell me? <laughs> Good night, Georgie. I'm telling you, George, you better watch your step with Brooksy. Didn't you ever hear the saying how when the cat's away, your secretary will play? Play what exactly, I don't know. But I do know that Robert Bailey plays George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, and Eddie Dunstetter kept things organized at the organ. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. (laughs) 
Do you remember way back in the 30s how the blowhards went around with the spiel? A car in every garage, a chicken in every pot. Do you know why they didn't have more success? They left something out. A valentine in every closet. Think of all the trouble he'd have saved you. Like the time Junior ran Rover through the lawnmower, as he figured he'd look better in a crew cut. Now don't take it out on the little rascal just because he has aspirations to be a barber. Let George do it. He'll give it to him once over light, like he never got. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun to George Valentine. He gets all kinds of mail. Take the letter he's about to get from this old tumbleweed character. Mr. Valentine, sir. Uh, I'm a cowboy movie star. I'm sure you must have seen me sometime, even if it's only on television. Uh, well, anyway, I, I know how silly it sounds, but uh, I need help. There's the most desperate situation that requires the action of a hero. And while I'd like to qualify, this same situation requires certain proficiencies that I haven't got. Notably, there's a mystery. Mysteries aren't my longest suit. Uh, you see, I met her. Uh, her, I mean, but just barely. And Mr. Valentine, this lovely young lady I refer to, she's in distress. She is. But, Mr. Disbro, in your letter you didn't tell Daphne. us... Daphne. That's who she is. Oh, Daphne. Daphne. Yeah. I met her just the other day, you realize. I was talking to a man I know, a song plugger. That's like a fuller brush man, only with music, you uh -huh. see. Uh, he pointed her out. The little school teacher type that's always having westerns, you know, big, bashful blue eyes and hair like honey and a heart just as big as all out of doors, you With know. a head to match. <laughs> I know. Oh, uh, who cares if she's smart? I don't. Uh, Anyway, I find this little girl lives all alone, way up in the Imperial Crest Apartments. Uh-oh, I take it back. <laughs> Daphne does all right, doesn't she? Oh, uh, she has money, but she's nervous, if you know what I mean. So nervous, she'll hardly talk. And afraid, oh, yeah, I, I think somebody's watching her up there. Well, I'm not surprised. A big bad wolf, maybe. Well, me? No, no, this is different, no. It is. She didn't even want to meet me, and most women do. Oh, now, look, cowboy. Yeah, and today when I tried to talk to her on the street, even after I'd been properly introduced, she just up, walked away. So am I. Now, wait, no, wait a minute, Mr. Valentine. Now, she wanted to talk, and she would have if the man she walked away with hadn't been carrying a gun. Oh. So maybe it is a case, huh? What man? Big. Bigger than both of us. Black hair and sour face. Her husband, maybe. Oh, no, she told me she wasn't married. I don't know who he is, but she's afraid of him, all right. Uh-huh. And what do you want me to do, scare him away? No, figure it out, Mr. Valentine. Go meet her. Protect her before something worse happens. And then let me know before it does. Oh, I see. That's it. I do the dirty work, hand you the answers, and then you step in to scare away the rustlers. And win the girl, of course. Well, that's right, honey. And having to keep my public name intact, uh, my fans and all, you know, I... I'm a beautiful patsy. Okay, partner. But don't think you've got a corner on the market. Well, you better get out your earplugs, kiddies, because me thinks there's going to be plenty of shooting in this here Opry. Oh, but don't put them in for just a minute, because first I want you to hear this. You know something? That did this old heart good. Now let's see if George is doing any good for Daphne. Uh-oh. Hey, George. Someone is trying real hard to bump you off. Hey, George. Duck! <laughs> Hey, what the... <laughs> I put your cigarette out, didn't I? Well, One shot at 30 feet, that's pretty good. Oh, but I missed the sandbag again. Look at them holes in my wall. Hey, lady, you got holes in your head. Oh, now, what? don't be angry. I'm practicing here on my roof garden. Now, see that clay pipe down there? <laughs> I never oh. miss. Oh, fine. You must make a big hit with lots of people. Well, my landlord and neighbors do complain once in a while. See the other pipe? Hey, you. But I talk them out of it. Well, now, look, I don't talk so easy. Don't you? No, he doesn't. 
Not when you're around, you mean. Oh, you all right, bet. Annie Oakley. So you're nice to look at. Daphne. Daphne Crockett. Girl type Davy. Crockett? Oh, of course. The Club Paris. Mm-hmm. I've been there five years. Longest run of any act in nightclubs. Everybody likes my shooting. <laughs> oh, so that's it. Little Red Riding Hood turns out to be Two-Gun Nelly. Professional bullseye artist. Mr. Valentine, where are you going? To see the bull about some black eyes. He... No, no, wait a minute. I'm here now. I might as well speak my piece, even if it's only for laughs. Speak your piece? Like Miles Standish? In a way. Only John Alden's name this time is Rafe Disbro. Oh, him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's funny, all right. He thinks you're in danger. The cowboy says you're being watched up here. He says what? Well, there's the building next door. I guess from that one apartment over there, you could oh, probably... Oh, no. No, of course not. All right, lady. But the rest of my recitation says you're afraid of a big man, black hair, sour face. How about that one? Mr. Disbro has quite an imagination, hasn't he? Maybe. And maybe not. I suppose he sent you over here to protect me. That was a general idea. And think twice before you say no. I'll show you what I think of Mr. Disbro in spite of that lovely Texas accent. You see those three little dolls in a row? Lady, I said think twice. And there are three bullets left in this gun. Oh, now look, if you are in trouble, Daphne... Three answers you can take back. Okay, lady, never mind. We get the idea. This is where we came in, Angel. (laughs) Hey, that was four. Miss Crockett, Daphne! Oh, hi. I'm all right. Oh, God. You missed me. What missed you? Where'd that extra shot come from? No. No, there wasn't one. Get out of here, won't you? Please leave me alone. Please, leave me alone. Don't waste your breath, lady. We've already gone. George, shall I telephone Lieutenant Riley? No, he's on vacation. Ask for Clary and tell him to get up there fast. Yeah, but George... I got a date next door, Angel. See you in the second reel. There's a card outside this apartment. Says R. Siever. You him? I don't know. You... Now look, Bright Eyes, I want to look... A guy comes busting in, upsets my equilibrium. I'm teaching myself to nasty. Now go away. All right, don't mind me. I won't tell if you cheat. Your manners get worse. The door's back that way. Remember? Yeah, just call me a building inspector. Come to take a look at your window, that's all. Don't fall out. Yeah. Yeah, this is it, all right. The only apartment from which you can see the roof garden. You don't say. The only apartment from which you could take a pot shot at a woman across the way there. Sit down. Maybe we could both learn canasta. You always wear a hat when you play cards? Sure. What woman? What's it cover up? Black hair to match your sour face? I said what? We don't like each other much, do we? Daphne Crockett. I was there when it happened. Now we like each other less, huh? I don't know. Friendship begins slow sometimes. Sit down, will you? I'll deal out a few. What do you use for chips? The bag there? Eh? The black bag there by your foot. The one you're trying to keep me from seeing. A real observant boy, aren't you? Wait a minute. I can see a hand when it starts to move, so stop moving it. I'm dealing this, Inspector. Oh, you're not. You're... (laughs) Too bad nobody can argue with a blackjack, Inspector. We might have had a nice little game. Shall I tell you what hit you, Valentine? No. But don't tell me that's Lieutenant Clary's voice, not at last. At last. Valentine, if you'd wait for the police once in a while, or better yet, if you wouldn't get mixed up in cases like this... All right, all right. You sound just like Riley. My headache's bad enough. Uh, His name was Curly. Curly Blackson, the strong boy, wanted for ducking out of prison back east. What was he in for? He was serving time for shakedowns. He was a blackmail artist. Blackmail? Hey, is there a little black bag still around here anyway? Never mind, of course not. No, there isn't, George. And this Curly may have been the man Rafe saw once with Daphne, but I don't think he took the shot at her across the way. He didn't talk like he did. Not to mention the small fact he had a gun, but it was still loaded and hadn't been fired for some time. He had a... So you know an awful lot, don't you, Lieutenant? Come on, wake up. Open your baby blue eyes wide. Huh? Oh, I get it. Curly's dead, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, I, 
I know I didn't do it. No, no, no. You just slept through it, that's all. First you get mixed up in it, but then when you might be useful, you take a rain check while Curly takes a bullet. Bullet? One shot cleans a whistle right through the heart from a short distance. Yeah. And he was armed. Somebody outdrew him or surprised him. And a marksman, too, huh? Or a markswoman. Yeah, where is she? Where is she? Where do you think she is? Gone, of course. And why we look for her? There was all the time in the world for this to happen. All the hey, time for the... Listen, take it easy. Hey, somebody's coming. Yeah. And remember, Lieutenant, the girl didn't shoot at herself out there on the roof. And if Curly hit it... Shh, wait a minute. Keys. Sure. Sure, it's the guy who lives here. I'll see you. You want to bet? All right, friend. That's enough music. You can notice this now. Grab him. Hey, that's what? it. Okay. Put down that stick, Buster. That's better. Well, a little surprise, that's all. He can let me go. I'm all right. You're all right. Sure. That at that bum, you're breaking my heart. Never leave a tune unfinished. <laughs> Had to finish it, that's all. Hey, didn't expect a room full of roses. Sit down. Roses are in seventh place this week, you know that? My name's Clary. Homicide. All right. Sit down. Sit. Listen, my friend. Hold on, Lieutenant. Just a minute. Roses are number seven, huh? How's Jealous Heart? A little raise on records. Down in sheet sales, though. <laughs> oh, but you ought to hear the blues number I've song got. Song plugger, huh? Maybe even the same song plugger who once introduced a cowboy to a girl. Maybe. I don't know. Play piano down at the Club Paris, too. The Club pa Oh. All begins to tie together, doesn't it? My friend, we're going to pull up our chairs for a nice long talk. <laughs> Be careful, don't stub your toe. What? Chairs are all nailed down. Keeps the maids from moving them around. Keeps the, <laughs> keeps the ma Look, Looney, Daphne Crockett was being watched from here, and I doubt if Curly did it. She was shot at from here, but he didn't do it. Did it, do it, did it. My name's Seaver, Lieutenant, not Looney. Seaver. Dick Seaver. Did I, Dick, they call me. Did I? And Curly was murdered by a dick. Well, brother, if you're crazy enough to wait admit minute, it. Wait a minute, Lieutenant, wait a minute. Chairs nailed down, that stick you carry. You haven't even noticed the body yet. You haven't been watching Daphne, have you, dead eye? Of course not. I couldn't. I'm blind. George, if I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times. Don't jump at conclusions. You tell me how a poor old blind guy goes around filling people full of lead. It just can't happen. Unless maybe he uses seeing-eye bullets. Hey, you know, that's all right. And for that matter, so is this. Say, before the shooting starts again, I think we should pause briefly for story identification, don't you? It seems that a self-styled cowboy named Rafe Disborough, who got himself fired from monogram because he could only ride side saddle, hired Valentine to keep his beady brown eye on a doll named Daphne. He figures that only one eye will be necessary, as he will have to keep the other one peeled for a guy named Curly, a black-haired character who is very repulsive. On further investigation, Daphne turns out to be an up-to-date Annie Oakley, who's been knocking him dead at the Club Paris with her fur-lined six-shooter. However, some patron who doesn't like the cover charge takes it out on Daphne and starts shooting back. Only he misses and plugs Curly. Meantime, George has been sleeping it off in Dead Eye Dick's apartment, a song plugger around town, as he has become very drowsy from a hit on the head. George immediately points the finger at Dead Eye. Only Dead Eye is blind and can't point back. Still, George figures that if he can plug songs, he can also plug people. However, this sets well with nobody, so he goes back to see Rape Disborough, who was no help either, because all he can say is, Gosh, Mr. Valentine, that's all I can say is, gosh. Well, you should try harder, Mr. Disborough. Usually, there's just the good men, the bad men. And the little school teacher in between, I know. Well, this isn't the plot of a western. But why you really wanted us to meet Daphne, you didn't say. So suppose you start saying, Buster, right now. Well, 
But uh, I told you she was in distress. Are you being blackmailed, cowboy? Uh Uh-huh. That was Curly's business, you know. And I saw a little black bag once. Blackmailed, I said. No. No, no, not me. Not you. Well, I'm always cautious about those things, but... Well, Daphne, she has another suitor besides me is Mr. Michael J. Martin. Martin? Yeah, one of those millionaire fellows. This is strictly confidential, you understand. And you figure Martin's a better sucker than you are, huh? Oh, well, he... He is a married man. You know, I have never taken that step. Uh-huh. And you really hired us to look into Daphne because you were afraid she was going to knock you over, too. Oh, no, no, Mr. Valentine. You totally misrepresent me. No, I mean nothing of the kind. The little lady is always innocent. Okay, Disbro. When you decide to tell me the truth, let me know, will you? I am. I'm just a bystander who... Or I... better yet, let the police know. This is still a murder case, Rafe. And they tell me cowboys are pretty good shots. Yeah, what? Oh, well, I'm just a singing cowboy. That's the last straw. No, I'm not proficient, except with a guitar. No, I don't shoot guns. Well, my fans wouldn't like it. Well, listen, I'll show you. Come on, Angel, let's get out of here. Here we are, George. Dressing room number four, three, two. Sure, sure. She's number one with a star on the door. In just a moment, please. I'm very sorry, but no one's allowed inside. Well, I'm sorry too, Shorty, but we want to see... Miss Crockett isn't receiving any callers this evening. She hopes you understand. Well, now, that's real thoughtful of her. Just step to one side. You needn't raise your voice, but if I haven't made myself clear... Oh, George, just pick him up and throw And I really don't feel like arguing about it. Shorty, get out of the... Well, hello, Mr. Valentine. Goodbye. Oh, no, you don't. Stand still, sister. Well, I really got nothing to say. Come along, Mike. Hey, get out of my way, Shorty. Wait a minute, you. Please don't be difficult, Mr. Valentine. Mac, Fred, Joe. Slow down, I said. Would you... Hey, quick. Oh, George. Let go. Let go. Will you... Bye-bye, Mr. Valentine. Hey, will you... All right, Mac, Fred, Joe, she's gone. You can let go. Sure, don't get sore. Let me brush your coat. The boys, huh? Stage hands, that's all. Don't want to see you getting in trouble. Buster, I'm not the one who's going to be in trouble. Oh, yes, you are. Little guy's important. Tough, too. The what? Little guy with it went with it. Uh, Michael J. Martin. Martin? You mean that little shrimp was Martin? Lucky we saved you, huh? Lion hunter, you know. Toughest little guy in the world. Best marksman, too. No, Miss Crockett isn't here. Of course she's not here. Don't expect her to show up. I even had one of our own men tailing her, and Martin shook him off, too. All right, all right, so she's not here. You said that, Lieutenant. Little schoolteacher type, caught in the middle. <laughs> Martin's not much to look at, only five feet tall. Two million bucks you could look at. Maybe blackmail does make sense. I told you that a long time ago. But nothing else means sense. Why did Curly come out here? Why did he get killed? Oh, stop asking questions. All right, you want an answer? Curly was Daphne's husband. What? It's in the record. They used to be married. Sure. And now she was afraid of him. Sure. Does it tie together a cowboy, lion hunter, Annie Oakley? Does it tell which one of those marksmen put a bullet through a man's heart with one shot? Let's not leave out Seaver. All right, so he's tied in. He's a friend of Curly's, too. But Angel, let me tell you something. When we were at the Club Paris, who was playing the piano? Huh? Well, it was... Oh, George, it wasn't Dixie. Uh-huh. See what I mean? He's missing, too. And you know, Lieutenant... A blind guy who's a heel could get into trouble easily. Now his heart's beating. Now he's just unconscious, I think. Come on, Seaver. Come on, snap out of it now. His door still open. Somebody must have slugged him when he was running out before he could get away. Oh, Daddy beat me. My head. Oh, he's okay. Take a look inside. That's what I'm doing. Quite a mess. It's been ransacked. All the drawers, only things still in place are the first... <gasps> Michael J. Martin. Dead. Would you look at that? Another one-shot victim. Sharp shooting. Even about the same distance. Yeah. Got Martin a little higher up, though. Hmm? Yeah, look here. Hit him right in the neck. So what? He's as dead as Curly, isn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just... What is it, George? The window. Lights just went on there, opposite. What? Yeah. Yeah, so they did. The roof garden. Our little Nell has finally come back home, huh? And, Lieutenant, if you work a process of elimination... Come on, let's get over there. I'll stay here. But, George... Go on, go on. I'll take care of Seaver here. Now, I'll take you five minutes to make it from building to building anyway. All right, we'll keep our eyes open. But you watch from here. Don't worry, I've been wrong before. I'm not going to be wrong this time. Get going. (laughs) Oh, Daddy, what a head. 
What's happening? What's happening, Mr. Valentine? Yeah. Come in, I'll give you a hand. Uh, thanks. Uh, that's my chair by uh, the poker table. Okay, careful now. Uh, there she is. Whew. Sit down yourself, Valentine. It's good for the rocks in your head. From the chair opposite me, the wing chair there, you can see out the window. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Already there, aren't you? I can tell by your voice. What you doing now? Nothing. Taking off a coat. Take off your coat. Take off your hat. <laughs> Cigarette? Got some right here on the table. No, thanks. Go on into the kitchen now. I bet you can't cook. You've never seen her, huh? Nope. Blind since I was 21. Lost him in a stick-up I got messed up in. Stick-up? Nice guy. Oh, I've been around. But I'm straight now. She's back on the roof now. Why do you say you're straight, Seaver, when you were all mixed up with Curly? <laughs> I didn't know he'd taken a hop from prison. He was up here all the time watching his wife, wasn't he? Sure. It's a cinch I wasn't. You were in on the blackmail with Curly, too, weren't you? Somebody must have tipped him off that there was a good touch going, that Martin here was a pushover. <laughs> all right, so what? What have I got to lose? Conspiracy to blackmail, but everybody's dead. You're right, we can't prove it. I've been around. You're not... <laughs> What's that? Oh, she's just practicing, that's all. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? Everybody's a marksman. You know, poor Martin there has a gun in his pocket, too, but he was outdrawn, just like Curly. That cowboy can shoot, too, Mr. Valentine. I don't believe that stuff he says to you. No, no, I'm not talking about murder anyway. I was thinking about when Daphne over there was practicing early and somebody took a pot shot and missed. What about it? Well, that couldn't have been a marksman, could it? So it must have been somebody who just stuck a gun out the window and shot to attract attention. <laughs> You've been around too, haven't you? You knew somebody'd come running over like I did and find Curly and lock him up. He was a fugitive. Good way to get rid of a partner, a Seaver. Well, she's going to work on the clay pigeons now. Good shot. Never mind her. Then what happened? Well, it didn't work, obviously. Curly knocked me out instead, so when you ducked back into the room to pick up the dough in the black bag, you found Curly alive and plenty suspicious. So you had to kill him, I guess. Oh, is that it? Now, how could a blind man do that? Then maybe later Michael J. Martin figured out who'd been in on the blackmail and came up for a little talk. So you had to kill him. <laughs> well, I guess you can't be blamed. Lots of people think I'm not really blind, but I am, see? Look. Look at the match in front of my eye. Never mind, skip it. <laughs> it's because you are blind that I know you killed both of them. Who else but a blind man would shoot two men at the same height? A big man in the heart and a five-footer like Martin in the neck. You're crazy, Mr. Valentine. I'm blind. I don't even know where people are. Little... You can tell by the sound of a voice, can't you? What? But not close enough to... Tell what chair they're sitting in? The chair that's always in the same place because it's nailed down? Well, come on now. Tell me the rest, Buster. What happens? Yeah. <laughs> You'd like to know how it works, wouldn't you? You'd like to know which chair. Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'll show you. It's the chair you're sitting in. Ain't I an old meanie, though? You know, a situation like this could set Cliff hanging back ten years, which might be a good idea. For that matter, so is this. Now let's see how the little game of Blind Man's Bluff is turning out. It can't be good for George. Because old Deadeye is getting his jollies over something. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? The blind man can fool them all. A little heavy on the downbeat, maybe. <laughs> eh, won't look like a marksman this time. Ah, but the coroner won't care. I'll just move him out of the chair and... Valentine. Valentine, where are you? Where are you? Just where <laughs> I was, Siva. Huh? Standing by the side of this chair. Oh, 
thank you, Mr. Valentine. I can't tell you how grateful I am for apprehending that barman. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. He was a little twisted, I guess. George, we've got to be going. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. I asked you out here to explain about her. Oh, boy, he's really nice. She was afraid of her husband, she was, afraid of what he might be up to. And, and she wasn't really mixed up uh, much with that rich man, Mr. Martin. Oh, we know, Rafe, you told us. She's a schoolteacher type. I hope you'll be very happy. Oh, I'm sure we will, Mr. Valentine. <sighs> well, this is the last real angel. So look out for the cactus while we <laughs> mount up and ride off into the sunset, leaving the little ranch house behind. Huh? Well, George... Uh... At this point, doesn't the hero usually kiss the girl? Oh, no, man. Huh? He always kisses the horse. Oh. Uh. You know, after a crack like that, I'm not going to even try and defend that boy anymore. I'm just going to say that Robert Bailey played George Valentine with the story by David Victor and Jackson Gillis. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, you all set for another visit with Valentine? You know George. He's the boy whose motto in life is let George do it. Nothing too small, nothing too big. Better still, nothing too dangerous. He runs an ad in the personal column, but some of his clients are sent by friends. That is, if you can call Lieutenant Riley a friend. Dear Mr. Valentine... I am without doubt the ugliest man in the world. Hey, wait a minute. Who is this? However, I need your help or the man standing beside me will go crazy. Because, Mr. Valentine, I... Riley, it's you, isn't it? Lieutenant Riley. Yes, yes, it's me, and I'm the one going crazy. All right, have it your own way. Only, what are you talking about? Valentine, I've got a client for you. A little ugly stumble bum wants your help. A slot machine repair man, no less. He needs help, or at least he won't help me unless somebody helps him. Only he won't trust the police I don't blame him. You make so much sense. Uh, Okay, then. Let's say I need your help. Sure, this little guy isn't much, but the idea Riley, hold it, will you? You said this guy's dying? Yeah. Police hospital. The doctor gives him a day or two at the best. Can't operate, can't stop the infection. From what, Lieutenant? Oh, gunshot wound, Miss Brooks. One gun, but all six shells. Happened in a dark alley. Whoever it was didn't want to miss him, I guess. That little man must be tough. Maybe. Or lucky or unlucky. He's one of those guys who's born to end up at the bottom of the pile, Valentine. Then why are you so interested in him? It's just possible that he can steer us all the way to the top of the pile. His name's Trailer. I told you he was the littlest shrimp in the slot machine racket. The repair man. Well, we've never found out who the big shrimp is. Uh, Ah, I see. I worm my way into the man's confidence, and then maybe he spills. Is that it? Blows the whole racket apart. No, no, no. You just help the little guy find his girl. Betty. Betty, that's her name. I was going to see her tonight. Betty who, Trailer? 
What's the rest of her name? She's beautiful. I'm not but she is. I'm just her bill, she said. But you don't believe it either, do you? Trailer, can you understand me? There's nobody in the world to believe. You gotta be careful. You can't trust people. You gotta test them and test them and test them. And then, then you can't trust them because they're all the same. What are you talking about friend? the racket? I won't tell you anything. I won't. I should. All right, all right. I take it easy. I, Who shot you? Ants. You can test people to see if they're ants, you know. Put honey in front of them. See if they choke themselves. Why did you ask me? Betty. Hey, Trailer. Fine Betty. Hey, look, Trailer. Uh, 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 Nurse? Betty. Guess you can have him back for a while. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Riley, I'm willing to bet he doesn't know anything that'll ever help you pry open the big time. Is that so? Well, just let me show you. Look in here. Oh, you mean the tall, skinny man over there? Yeah, yeah, Wilson, the highest price legal beagle in the state. Waiting to see if anybody off stage needs defending. Huh? That's it, the watchdog, ever alert. Just in case the police have a squealer who might stop worrying about the girlfriend and climb out of his delirium long enough to sing. Sing? What's this? What's all this, Lieutenant? Somebody singing? That's right, Mr. Wilton. Trailer in there tells me you own all the slot machines in this state. <laughs> yes, of course. It's just a sideline, though, rather a bother, particularly when I don't live in this town. Here on business, Mr. Wilton? I beg your pardon. Uh, Mr. Valentine and Miss Brooks. Oh. How do you do? Charmed. No, I've uh, I've been retained by a client, Mr. Valentine. Oh, who's that? The Black Company. Ooh, Riley here knows about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Out-of-town corporation. Manufactures will-o'-the-wisps. Well, I'm only a lawyer. I'm not familiar. Oh, the Black Company's quite an outfit, Valentine. Perfectly legal. Only nobody knows who runs it. But do they own the slot machines? Oh, of course not. No do more Do they than I know do. who they make bank deposits for? Does this bird trailer even know who he works for? Does anybody? The basis of all good organization, Lieutenant, is the pyramid. Like a spy system, huh? No one man knows enough to incriminate any of the others. Then why are you here, Mr. Welton? Why are you worried about this trailer person? <laughs> I haven't really said I even know the man, have I? <laughs> Or that the company I represent is interested in anything more than employees' indemnity, his uh, accident, and so on? <laughs> Spoken like a lawyer. Riley, maybe it is possible that the best of pyramids get a little wobbly once in a while. Huh? Maybe it is possible that the reason trailer in there got shot was that he found out too much about the higher-ups. Yeah, hold it. Hold, hold it. Wait. Yeah, hello, Lieutenant Riley. Oh, I, I... I wanted to speak to the nurse about Bill Trailer. Well... All right, who's calling? Well, I... Uh, just the nurse, please. The nurse on duty there. Well, just a second. Valentine. Valentine, it's a girl. Now, take it, will you? You're the intern on duty, or anybody, anybody. What's this? Misrepresentation, Lieutenant? Here, let me have it. Hello? Nurse? Well, she'll be here in a second, honey. I'm the receptionist. Well, I just wanted to find out about a patient. I his name is Trailer. Uh, trailer? Well, uh, wait till I get my cards here. Trailer. Hurry up, please. Somebody said he was there, but I, I want to know what happened to him. Well, we had an appendix case come in this morning. Oh, just tell me what happened to him. Just... What? You don't handle cases like that in the police ward. Well, I meant in the other ward. I... Hmm. She hung up. It's all right. We got the number. Call came from a phone in a bar at 1612 Commercial Lane. The old Durfee Hill section, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's quite a district. 
A 50-cent flop house or a $5,000 penthouse? It's what the harness boys call the anthill, Valentine. The anthill? Mm Mm-hmm. Let's go, Brooksy. A million people a day use that phone. My friend, every third one tries a slug. But, bartender, all we wanted to Besides, know was... Besides, if you the... whistle the dame, where's it get you? Maybe your boyfriend's a prize fighter. Me, I'll take television any day. The girl used the phone only a few minutes ago. Who was she? Should I know? Should I watch the cash register and be a bulldog for the phone company at the same all time? All right, all right. You don't know. Or maybe you don't want to know. I suppose you never heard of a guy named Trailer around here, either. Trailer? No, not until the fight last night. What fight? Uh, him and Louie. Who'd you think? Nice guy, that trailer, I guess. But he'll never amount to much mixing it up with a guy hey, like slow Louis. down, will you? Slow down. Who's Louie? And what was this fight about? About a dame, natural, classy blonde, lives up the street, named Betty. Fight ended quick. We threw them both out. Betty! Sure. See what I mean about whistling at dame? You mean this guy, Louie's tough? Go on. Go on. More about Louie. Not a price letter, no, but a real sharp boy. Just the same. Working his way up for a good outfit. Makes collections for the black company. That slot machine's to you. Oh, fellow employee, huh? Only Louie's higher up in the pile. He makes collections from guys like you. From me? You, you're crazy. Sure. Sure, what's the rest of his name? Louie what? Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. Good day, friend. Brooksy, this is where your job begins. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, sister. Wrong place. No Betty here. Now beat it, will you? Hi, lady. Find your party? Well, no. This gentleman Look, what is I... this? A census bureau? Box of flowers, Max. Sign here. What? Oh, look. All of you go someplace. I huh? haven't got all day. Sign here and don't keep the pants. All right. All right. Yeah, not clear up. A dime. Ah. Uh, people send you flowers? Come on in. I don't know where Betty is. What do you want? Well, just to see her. Betty sings down at the nightclub, I found out. She mentioned to me once about a job, and I thought maybe dancing or selling oh, cigarettes the might... Oh, great unemployed, huh? Look, you gotta be a jerk not to get along in this world, sister. What's the matter? No angles? Oh, I'm just new in town. Gee, that's a pretty box, isn't it? You gonna open them? Oh, how do you like that? Dated yesterday. Now, there's a florist who's gonna fall right out of business. Betty gets them like that all the time, sister. She knows her way around. Nothing better than the best. Gee, I met Betty's boyfriend, too, once. Trailer or something. <laughs> That's what he told you? Boyfriend? <laughs> There's a laugh. <laughs> well, it's sure he wasn't dressed so good. <laughs> oh, hopeful, Harry. She can do better than him any day. I didn't know. You mean you're the one she... Say, roses. Look, I'm Betty's brother. My name is Louie. Oh, now, where did you say you met Betty? <laughs> Gee, has a girl got to relieve all of her privacy? We was only in the beauty shop. I was seeing about a tent. Oh, don't look at me that way. She spoke to me because I complimented her on a corsage she said a boyfriend gave her. Boyfriend? <laughs> look at that, sister. Those aren't just roses. a wristwatch wrapped around them, you see? Holy smoke! I'm an admirer, see? Guy she hasn't even met. Told you she was good looking. You ought to hear what they say about her singing. Well, go on places, her and me. Uh, you don't have to hate my wrist about it. Uh, <laughs> so go be unemployed. Beat it, will you? Dear Betty, I look forward to meeting what? you. What's that? I'm on the level, and I don't mean just opposite your eyes when I say I'm not a masher, and won't you please, please telephone me at Durfee Hill. Hey, let give me that. that. Hey, let go. It's just a card with the roses, that's all. Come on, get out of here. Gosh, I'm not going to try to beat Betty's time or anything. I'll say you're not. I never... Heard that name anyway, Mr. Black or... Black! Valentine, of course, of course she's all right. You talk to her yourself, did you? Sure, Brooksy read me the note she'd seen on the flowers, but why... We had a man watching him. After Miss Brooks left that place, this Louie fella took off in the opposite direction like a flying duck. But my man lost him. Now, now, will you please clear up what you've been doing? That Durfee Hill number in the flower note. It's a new number, Riley. Private listing and installed only a couple of days ago from somebody from out of town who just rented this place. What place? The fanciest penthouse in the whole section. Hey, Riley, people really look like ants from up here. You mean... Sure, sure, I'm in the place. There was a loose hinge on the service door and nobody inside. You've got the loose hinge, my friend. Don't you realize it was a Mr. Black who sent those flowers? Oh, Riley, add two and two, will you? Nobody knows who owns the slot machines. Who runs the black company? 
And yet a mysterious Mr. Black shows up in town, a man nobody's seen, not even the janitor downstairs. Trailer's girl, Betty, she must have seen him. No, remember, he just wanted to meet her. Probably had seen her at the nightclub or something. But that was Black's mistake if he wanted to stay incognito, giving a girl his telephone number. Because now here I am with $10,000 in my pocket. But what? What'd you say? Sure. Must be collection time in the three lemon business. About two seconds ago, a delivery boy hands me an envelope at the door. Inside was an accounting sheet for all the slot machines on the south side and proceeds for the past month. Well, I... Riley, be... I figured out who's the man at the top of the anthill. Don't ask me how long it'll last or why it works this way. But right now, Riley, that man seems to be me. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. You go to help Lieutenant Riley. Because there's a man dying in the police hospital who might tell what he knows about the slot machine racket, provided somebody helps him find his girl, Betty. Well, so far you haven't found Betty, though you have discovered that there's someone else in her life. Someone a little more successful than Trailer, a man who calls himself Mr. Black, who owns the slot machines, whose identity is a secret even from his own employees. Only if your name is George Valentine, now it's you who occupy Mr. Black's apartment. It's a dangerous game, and no one realizes that better than Claire Brooks. Down at the police hospital now, she seems unable to help. I, I don't know anything. I tell you, Trailer, I don't know. if you could just mm-hmm. remember why you and Louie had that fight last night in the bar, was mm-hmm. it over Betty? Betty? Or is something wrong in the business? In the black company? Fine, Betty. Just fine, Betty. No, of course not, Brooksy. We've gone way past trailer now. We're in the middle of the ants, the scramblers. The police have the apartment surrounded now, George. Well, tell them to keep out and lay low unless I whistle for help. But, George... Angel will never find out who fired those shots in the trailer or who runs this rack unless we ride right along with a gag. You'll ride yourself right into a funeral notice. Sooner or later, the person who rented that apartment will come back I said then... don't worry, will you, Brooksy, as long as I can... What? Go on, George. What do you people wash those shirts in anyway? A huh? cement mixer? The, the collars come back with ground glass on the edge. George, what's the matter? Who well, cares? just don't use so much starch, that's all. Hello. I didn't mean to interrupt. The door was open. All right, then shut it and come in. Well, what is it? What do you want? Uh, don't get soap, boss. Now take it easy. Your name's Louie, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. Sure it is. How'd you know? You fit the description. Look, look, I, I know I'm not supposed to be here. I know I should have just sent the stuff up by messenger the way we always do, wherever the point is each oh, month. Oh, so but... that's it, huh? You're a collector. Uh, Durfee Hill on east side, sir. You brought some money. All right, let's have it. Here, here. The accounting sheet's right on top. I had all those figures in my head. It's a trick. I taught myself. Right, boy. I, I know it's not healthy to come up here and find out who you are like this, Relax, but I... relax, will you? Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew you wouldn't mind when you saw that. It's almost double last month. Twenty-three thousand five hundred bucks. What did you do? Fix the machine so they pay in bubble gum instead of jackpots? Oh, oh, oh no, sir. No, I, I didn't touch them. But uh, I've been in there giving them the old boost. You know, talking it up with the bartender. A real climber in the business, aren't you, Louis? Uh, now, what's this really about, Buster? How did you make so much money this month? Well, well the truth of the what happened is... to Trailer, the repairman? I don't know what you mean. Happened? Who shot him? Boss, listen, he was cheating you. Did you know that? Did you? I can prove he was. He was what? Holding out. Jack up the setting in the machines and then split the rake off with bartenders. That's how he did it. You must have heard the same thing Mother districts. He floated around all of them, didn't he? You know, it's getting too complicated for me. Uh, now, wait a minute. Wait, listen, that's how I built up my total for the month, by catching him at it and stopping it. Yeah, you earned the Silver Star, all right. Uh, look, who are you, who you going to call? Listen to the rest of what I got. Buster, I'm going to see a man about pinning a medal on you. But I didn't do it. I didn't empty any gun into him. Well, everything happens at once. Uh, you want me to get it for you, Buster? No, no, I'll get it. 
Go make yourself a drink or something. Uh, don't mind if I do. I-, I know who it is anyway. Huh? This is great. Oh. Hello. I guess you're the man, huh? <laughs> Are you the girl? Don't be funny. I mean, well, after all the notes you've been sending me with the flowers. Oh, sure. Come in, come in, Betty. Thanks. Say, you live all right, don't you? I hope to. Uh, you know, you're not so easy to find, Betty. I've been wanting to meet you for some time now. Yeah, I got the idea. Do you always use that whirlwind stuff, flowers and presents on a girl, Mr. Whatever your name is, Black? Or... Hey, slow down. Take your coat off. Uh, sure. Well, you wanted to meet me. You saw me in the nightclub and you heard my singing and you wanted to meet me. Well, now, who wouldn't? You're very beautiful. Do a girl good to be known she associates with you? <laughs> no comment. Any girl would break her neck to get up here. She'd give her eye teeth to walk up close to you like this. Hey, what's the matter? Hey, you dirty hey, sis, bitch. cut it out. Cut it out, sis. You said you'd be nice. Now stop it. Will you cut it out? I, I don't know what's the matter with the boss. Honest, I don't. suppose you both be quiet. She said she was coming up here to see you. She promised. She promised you would. You know, I, I, I told her what a great guy. You I know. said, I, shut up, killer. What? <laughs> now, 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 look, boss, this is my sister. See, one of the greatest kids in the I know, world. I know, I know. A guy could go places if his sister associated with a big shot like what me. What was it you said? You called Louie. Freddy, you came up here to find out about Trailer, didn't you? To slap my face and ask the big shot which one of his hired hands was responsible for your boyfriend being down there in the hospital. Wasn't that it? He's not a boyfriend. She's ten times as good as him. He's only been hanging around a couple of months. Sure, he's not an eager beaver like you, Buster. He wouldn't try to use his own sister to get him ahead in the world. Oh, no, no, they just... Thought about it. In that bar the other night? Oh, yeah, but that was all. I told him to stay fight. away and he got me and it took no. me one at a time, will you? Honestly. You live with the no, ants. Don't you know what they're like yet? Or was that what you saw in trailer? That he was a little different from the scramblers? It was a dope. He was stealing, holding out. You want to bet it was you who was holding out from collections, Louis, and he caught you at it? Boss, so no, long came no. a chance to get rid of two birds with one stone. Get in the boss's good graces and cover your Louis, own tracks by being the guy. You said you didn't see Trailer after that fight. Well, All I, I, I know, I... buddy, is that your brother said something to me a minute ago about a gun being emptied in the trailer. Huh? Well, it so happens he was shot six times. Only how could you know about that little specific thing, Louie, unless you Boss, were the guy? look, everything I've done is for you. It's for the good of the company. I'm looking ahead all the time. See, I, I want to... Fl- he did it, if you like. Huh? What? Hey, who's that boy? Got a gun. Shut up. Hello, Mr. Wilton. <laughs> party's over, huh? Yes. Yes, the party's over, I'm afraid. And besides, it's making too much noise. Next door? No, I've been in the back of a wardrobe you overlooked. Oh, sure. Well, I didn't think it could last. It never did make sense that such a careful setup as this apartment wouldn't have... Wouldn't have me. Yes, me. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. So's Louis, so's Betty. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Look, who is this guy? Now, if the three of you will I'll just... I'll take care of him. down boss. that gun, Buster. Don't worry, he can't get away with anything. Stand Louis, stop it, you're making a mistake. Louis! Louis! Ambitious to the end. Couldn't resist trying to make one last impression on you, could he, Mr. Valentine? Mr. what? (laughs) Yes, Betty. I'm afraid I'm the Mr. Black who's been so anxious to meet you. It was too bad. Things couldn't have worked out better for us. But if you're Mr. Black... The great organizer. The best of pyramids totter once in a while. I was here to make my own collections this time. I thought it was about time for a visit to South America. So if you'll just hand over my money... Why don't you come and get it? You've caused enough trouble already, Valentine. Sure, come on, come on. Shoot some more people. I'm warning you. No! It's the only way you're going to get out of here. Valentine, I... that gun! Well, thanks, Riley. Mr. Slot Machine King, see what the sound of those shots brought you? Three lemons. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. And now, 
back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. And that was it, Trailer. A gun test proved that Louis shot you. Yeah. Why? Well, ambition, I guess. Cover his own mistakes, get in good with a big boss. Mm-hmm. Can you understand me, Trailer? Mm-hmm. Can you understand what I'm saying? Yes, and all scrambling around. That's all Louis was. Sure. That's all Wilt is, too. But the girl's different. I think she'd like to see you, Trailer. Yeah. Yeah, we found Betty. She's a nice girl. Yeah. Yes, I know. Since when? What? I said, since when did you know? I mean, that she was the kind of a girl who's a little different. Who might have really meant it when she said she liked an ugly little guy like you. Mr. Valentine, I'm very tired. I'm very... Wilton isn't kidding anybody. I just want you to know that I know that, Trevor. I've begun to guess it. I... His biggest mistake was trying to take over the slot machine empire tonight. Like the rest, he couldn't resist the opportunity. George... Think back, Angel. Wilton's tall and skinny. Would he have ever written a note to Betty, just an ordinary-sized girl, saying, I'm on the level, and I don't mean just opposite your eyes? No, of course he did He's only a lawyer. A rat trying to grab what he can off a sinking ship. But Valentine, I had no idea. I'll say it for you, Trevor. Uh, uh, Wilton didn't ever own the slot machines like he claimed he did at the last minute. And he wasn't the Mr. Black in the notes. No, they'd have to be a short man, probably. A little guy. Yeah. A little guy. Like maybe a man who'd made such a success out of not trusting anybody that he couldn't believe a girl liked him. He had to test her by making her think a big shot was after her. To see if she'd drop him and run for the honey. He was in town for the collections anyway. And to nose around the way he always did, inspecting the anthill he'd built while looking like a repairman. You mean... Trailer here is really Mr. Black? Yeah, Brooksy. What would you have done, Trailer, if Betty had dropped you and chased after you, Mr. Black, the way her brother wanted her to? I... I would have killed her. No. No, I... I wouldn't have. I... I don't... I know, Buster. It's pretty ironic. You kept your identity so secret. You did so well. But what happened... You got shot by a guy whose only ambition was to get in good with the boss, make a big, fine impression on you. Now you still want to talk to Betty while you can, Mr. Black? No. No. She's... Leave her out of our anthill. You have just heard The Ant Hill, another adventure with George Valentine. Robert Bailey stars as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, uh... Do you ever hear of anyone who was afraid of an angel? Now, I'd always heard there were pretty nice people with wings and harps and stuff. But not so with Lefty's gal Friday. She had this angel as figured packing forty fives, all aimed at her. Now, instead of getting panicky and chewing her nails until she resembled Venus to Milo, she should have looked up George Valentine. His motto is, let George do it. 
and he isn't afraid of forty fives or even forty sixes. I must say, however, she had a reason to be scared. You see, she played a big part in building this angel. And just in case you've never seen an angel being manufactured, listen, and you'll get it firsthand. <laughs> Extra, get your paper. Let the lump but kill an auto crash. Law couldn't get him, but wet pavement did. Here you are. Let the lump but bitch that guy. You say your name's Emerson. You heard me, Mr. Valentine. Frank J. Emerson. Oh, but you're the president of... That's right, young lady. Emerson and Citibank. And I'm a very busy man. I only want to know if you've read about Lefty Lumpert's death in that auto accident. Sure, who hasn't? Naturally, naturally. When the biggest crook in town dies, it's news. Young lady, but I know what sort of reputation Mr. Lumpert was supposed to have. Well, just because they could never nail anything on him, not even the income tax. Board. Of course, yes, yes, I know. But I must remind you that Mr. Lumpert owned a perfectly respectable small investment <laughs> office. Invest in a dog track or a five-foot shelf of bookies. Perfectly respectable, I said. Regardless of whatever criminal connections or power Mr. Lumpert may or may not have had... That front, that uh, business of his, was proven many times to be perfectly... Yeah, useful. perfectly respectable. I heard you the first time. Okay, okay. Lumpert was real smart. He worked alone. He never told anybody anything. His ostensible occupation was strictly legal. There. That reassure you? Well, yes. I just wanted to make sure... Only, uh, what's it to you? Why so insistent? And why should a banker like yourself be concerned with Mr. a guy... Mr. Valentine, my bank has done business with Lefty Lumpert many times. Oh... And never mind that tone of voice, either. A dollar is a dollar. Our money was only used in legitimate purposes. It's not up to us to refuse business to a man merely because he's supposed to be engaged in other outside activities, is it? No, really, let's not be naive. Oh, no, no, let's not be naive. All right, Mr. Valentine. It's embarrassing. Of course it is. Business is business, and I have nothing to be ashamed of. But, uh, well, I've never liked it very much. Then why are you here? Why does Lumpert's death oh, mean... Oh, no, no, no. Don't get the wrong idea, please. There's nothing I'm really worried about. But you see, he had a secretary, Myrtle Dane. And through the years, I've got to know her pretty well. Myrtle Dane? The one who was in the accident with him? That's right. Probably as close to him as anyone could ever be. At least anyone from the legitimate end. She's quite a person, Myrtle. <laughs> She's uh, rationalized working for him much better than I have. A very realistic person. A very good secretary. If she knows anything about Lefty's more private life... She certainly never let on. Wait just a minute. The newspaper said that Miss Dane was hurt. She was driving, they were going to an appointment, and in a hurry, but the steering wheel saved her. Banged up and shaken a good deal, yes, but not badly enough to make her behave irrationally. What do you mean? I've just been to see her at the hospital. Normal, friendly act, that's all. But she refused to see me. I forced my way in, but it didn't do any good. For some reason, Mr. Valentine, the girl is terrified. She's even afraid of me. Uh -huh. What do you want me to do about it? If there is any scandal or kickbacks or new discoveries about Lumpert's activities now that he's dead, I'll admit I want to protect my own name and the name of the bank. But also, Mr. Valentine, I think it's my duty as a citizen to wonder, why is she afraid? <laughs> You know, I think that's a pretty silly question. Now, if you'd taken part in bumping off the town's leading gangster, how would you feel? Now, don't start looking for the nearest cave, because I want you to hear this. Now, let's see how George is doing with Myrtle. Nope. She's still standing her ground. No, I don't want to see anyone. I told you. They brought you some candy, dear, and the doctor... Please, nurse, how many times Hello, do I Myrtle. have to... how are you feeling? What? Uh, will you excuse us a minute, nurse? Yes, Mr. No, come back here. I told you. That I... <laughs> Sorry, but she's a friend of Miss Brooks here. Hello. Who are you? What do you want? Nothing. Brought you some candy. Take it away. Get it out hey, of here. Hey, take it easy. Myrtle, look. It is just candy. That's Won't all. Don't blow up or anything. Uh, a little nervous, aren't you? I I'm sorry. The nurse called you Mr. Valentine, didn't she? You're George Valentine. I know you're all right. I... There's a hall full of flowers and fruit and candy out there. Lots of people have been pestering you, huh? <laughs> Suddenly I'm popular. At my age and with my face, can you imagine? 
Who sent you? Emerson. Oh, the banker. Well, you can tell Mr. Emerson that I am not just another working girl out of a job. I have been very well paid. I don't want another job. That I am taking a year off to take a trip around the world and will probably never come back to this town or ever talk about the time I've spent here. Hold on, hold on, will you? I don't believe you. What? Mr. Valentine, the doctor says I can leave this hospital in about ten minutes. And I tell you, I'm going straight to the airport. I know, I... I know, sure. You're running away fast. But to work for a guy like Lefty Lumpert, you must be a very sharp and cold-blooded girl. Certainly smart enough to know that people will raise their eyebrows and say, oh, she only worked in his legitimate enterprises, huh? Running away, huh? Keeping your mouth shut. You wouldn't believe me one way or another. Any more than anyone else would when I tell them I know nothing about Lefty's criminal connections. No, you're wrong again. I do believe you. Thank you. A dollar is a dollar, you know. But it takes some rationalizing to work at a job like mine for so many years and ignore the other kind of remark. Whose remarks? What makes you so bitter, Myrtle? Oh, no, you don't. My personal life is still private. Big Shot dies unexpectedly. Faithful, tough private secretary is suddenly scared to death. Why? Well, that's the only reason I'll believe you didn't really know anything about Lefty. Because now you don't even seem to know whom you should be afraid of. Mr. Valentine, there's an assistant district attorney by the name of Bill McCoy. Do you know him? No, but I can certainly find him. Find him and meet me at Lefty's office. Give me an hour to get dressed and checked out of here. Why? (laughs) Because the two of you are like cold water in the face. Oh, no, I'm not afraid of Bill. Maybe you've just reminded me of my debt to society, that's all. Is he the one? Bill? What one? I'm not very good at double talk. Yes, you are. Because I'm doing it right now, of course I am. He's the only person who hasn't come to see me. Bill McCoy. All right, so I'll go see him. And we'll all try to solve the riddle of Lefty together, shall we, Mr. Valentine? Well, that's the general idea. I'm scared, Mr. Valentine, but you're wrong. It's not because I don't know whom to be afraid of. No. No. And it's not any mysterious partner of Lefty's, either. It's an angel. I'm scared to death of Lefty's angel. An angel, George? Protect her, Brooksy. That's what she was talking about. She means a guy like Lefty couldn't get along without someone to protect him from higher up. Oh, someone respectable. Maybe that's why the police could never get anything far enough. Hey, hold it. Huh? Hey, you. That's not the way you get into a hospital, is it? Through the fire entrance? You make up the rules or something? Oh, but I got friends on this floor. That brightens my whole day. Now get out of the way. Hey, look, that's an operating room. You want to visit that? Eh? Only a couple of private rooms up here. Hey, maybe you're mixed up. At least my friend doesn't want to see anybody. Come on, come on now. I'll show you the reception desk. I got business to attend to, and I get oh, out no, of the way. Oh, no, you don't. I'm going to see you and you can't stop That's me. That's what you think. All right, all right. Cut it out. Mistake, see? That's all. On the wrong floor, I guess. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Come back here, you. See you again sometime. George, what on earth was I that? Stop being tough when I bumped his chest when I noticed he carried a gun. Oh. she afraid of an angel or a devil, George? Hey, look, get to the police and give them a description of that guy, will you? And check the reception desk on everybody else who's tried to see Myrtle. I got a hunch this case is going to go off like a string of firecrackers. Did we keep you waiting, Myrtle? Found your friend here in the barber shop. Hello, Myrtle. Hello, Bill. <laughs> well, that's a friendly greeting. Why did you want to see me here at Lefty's office, Myrtle? I thought the big investigator might enjoy a chance to search through Lefty's private papers. Well, McCoy, it seems like the place to start if we're going to try to find out who his angel was. No, no, I just thought it would be a good idea. Hmm? We're too late. Somebody beat us to it. Look. Holy smoke. Yeah, looks like a typhoon went through here. It was like that when I got here a few minutes ago. Filing cabinets open, papers all over the floor. Yeah, and any incriminating papers just plain aren't here anymore, check. I've never told this to Bill, Mr. Valentine. But Lefty always said the law would never get him. He had an angel watching over his shoulder. Yeah, an angel who just tore this place apart. Yes, that's the point. Lefty was no fool. If there was such a person, then somewhere he must have kept a file on him to protect himself. Only where is it? Oh, cut it out, both of you. He didn't keep it here. Huh? How do you know? 
If his own secretary is... I was more delicate, but I ransacked the place myself two nights ago. You what? And there wasn't anything here then, Valentine. Two nights ago? The same night you took me to the movies? Oh, now take it easy, Myrtle. And you said you had to go home early to get some sleep? Mr. Valentine, do you know how many years this waste basket from the district attorney's office has been trying to get something on my boss? Do you know how many laws he's broken himself? Cut it out, will you? A job is a job. Yes, isn't it, though? Like... Like taking me out of Okay, never mind. You're on opposite sides of the fence. You don't like each other. Myrtle, he's dead now. Please, won't you... Oh, Skipper, will you? Hey, Myrtle, did Lefty have a safe deposit box? Yes. I know where the key is. You know what's in that box? No. I suppose you won't believe that either, though. Oh, for the love... Look, Myrtle, the thing I've been trying to do ever since he died is to round up that muscle head of his, Murphy. I don't know anything about him either. I've only seen him once or hey, twice. Hey, hold on, will you please? What's all this? Who's Murphy? The other side of Lefty's life, bodyguard, errand boy. Myrtle's right, he never hung around the legitimate end. Murphy is a big, ugly guy with one cauliflower ear, which is probably the only ear that's ever heard Lefty in private with whoever he dealt with. Wait a minute, I'll get that. Hello? George, I'm down at the police station, and I gave them a description of that man in the hospital. Huh? Oh, Brooksy, yeah, yeah, I already know who he is. You do? Just caught on this minute. His name was Murphy. He's the link with the angel. Maybe Lefty's only link with his angel. Hey, watch this. Who are you talking to? Mr. Valentine, you mean you've seen Murphy? Wait, wait a minute, Brooksy. Listen. No, George, you listen. You wait a minute. Do you know that they found Murphy ten minutes ago in an alley? Do you know that Murphy's dead? That he's been murdered? Say, this angel really gets around, doesn't he? Or is it Lefty's angel? Could be that uh, eager beaver from the DA's office. I wouldn't know. I only know a good thing when I hear it. Just like you're going to right now. Now, Lefty Lumpert, the big shot no one could ever nail, least of all Bill McCoy, the DA's man who's always handled the case, is finally dead from an automobile accident. But what's to become of Lefty's mysterious underworld empire? Well, the secretary who handled Lefty's legitimate business says that Lefty had an angel, a protector, but she doesn't know who it is, of course. A faithful bodyguard named Murphy might know, but he's just been shot to death. So if your name is George Valentine, you know that now it'll take some fast flying to catch up with an angel. But, Brooksy, where was That's the... That's all I know so far, George. The police are down there now. It was in the alley, just a block from the hospital. So it must have happened just after we chased him away from Myrtle. Okay, Brooksy, stay there at headquarters. I'll meet you later. Hey, Myrtle, you said you know where Lefty kept his safe deposit key. Yes, of course. All right with you, McCoy? Sure, if Lefty had a file on the angel. Okay, somewhere. then let's go. Sometimes files have teeth. Now, one of the bigger sized boxes. At least he had plenty of room for this stuff. Miss Dane, Mr. Valentine. Hold it. Well, well hello, Mr. Emmers. And McCoy. I noticed you people come into the bank. I hurried over as fast as I could. Thanks, but I don't think we need you. Left your safe deposit box. That's what you're after. Any objections? Well, no, not at all, as far as I'm concerned. I've got the authority. I'll take the responsibility for approving it with a court order. Well, my signature's on file as Lefty's secretary, if you'd rather we handle it that way. No, no, no. Go right ahead. Yeah. You just wanted to watch, huh? Okay, here goes. Hmm. Plenty of stuff. Well, these are just income tax things. How about this? Oh, wait a minute. No. No, it's the same. And these are audits from the investment office, see? Bonds, 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 bonds. Brother, look at this. I know we had a lot of money invested in buildings. There's a million here. bucks worth here, or I'll eat it. Lefty never talked much about his money. Say, look, let's not be naive, Emerson. Lefty couldn't have made that kind of dough with his legitimate business. Of course not. Not a tenth of it. So you prove he had other enterprises. So what? We already know that. Oh, come on. This is no good. We're wasting a... Hey. Yeah. Dusty little envelope down at the bottom. Acme Rental Service. Here, let me have that. All right. Take it easy. 
Ah, a key. Nothing in it but a key. Well, it looks like a house key. We can trace it all right. There's a date on the envelope. Acme will have a record. Sometimes I've called Lefty at his house and there wasn't any answer. I mean, lots of times when he was supposed to be home. And his wasn't... own home is pure as driven snow. So maybe he had another house, a place nobody knew about. The guy playing it safe would keep a duplicate key in the bank. Okay. I'll see you later. What? I'm running over to Acme. Valentine, you worry about the murder. Running down Lefty's other life is my worry. Well, well. After all this time of getting nowhere, the heroic DA's man steps in. Sure, I'm after a headline. So what? Skip it, and I'll call you back in an hour. So you want to know about Murphy's record, eh, Valentine? A guy like Lefty can be a smart lone wolf, but not a strong man. Sure, that's the idea, isn't it? So you ask me about the weak link strong Johnson, man. Johnson, what's eating you anyway? Oh, nothing. Murphy was just as smart as his boss. Never been locked up, never had friends, never hung around bars and shot his mouth off. So he's dead and we might as well forget about him. You want to know something? I bet he didn't even know anything about any angel. Just left these big, faithful muscles. And what's all this stuff on your desk here? Angels. I'm starting a list of angels. And do you know how many there might be? What do you mean? The DA's office always thought Lefty played it alone, like a genius. So now we get into it, because there's murder. And what do we find? Well, Emerson at the bank has dealt with him for a long we time. We find a corporation executive who played cards every Friday with Lefty for years. A real estate king, a fire chief. My friend, I'm telling you, there could be an angel behind every cloud. Okay, okay, Johnson, I get it. Now, which one is it? His lawyers, that's the best bet. Big, respectable outfit. Ask them to call back. Hello? Oh, uh, who is this? Here, give me that phone. Take the extension. What is this, a date bureau? Hello, Myrtle. Mr. Valentine, did he call you? Who? Bill McCoy. He was going to. He was going to call me, and it's nearly two hours. No, no, he hasn't, Myrtle. Say, where are you? I called his office, but they haven't heard from him, and I stopped by his apartment, but nobody answered. Listen to that. Everybody's getting into the... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Myrtle, I'll ask the police to... I checked the Acme place, and they gave me the address he went to. It's a houseboat. What? But I still can't find Bill. Amateur detectives. Listen, lady. Mr. Valentine, come out here fast, will you? That's where I am. Lefty's hideout. The houseboat. Pretty fancy place. Yes. Rigged strictly for business, though. It's where he must have handled his contacts and things. Well, there's certainly nobody here. Say, was the door open like that when you came here? Yes, I haven't touched anything. I don't care about that. I was just thinking about keys. What? What do you mean? Well, if a guy's careful enough to keep one in the bank, chances are there's only one other. Left his own key. Well, that was in his pocket in the wreck, George. Lieutenant Johnson checked the number of it for me. So the only key loose is the one McCoy has. So he must be the one who left the door open. But why? Unless he was in such a hurry. Take it easy, will you? He means quite a lot to you, doesn't he? And vice versa. No. No, I hate him. Always following me around. Hey, wait a minute. You notice the wall safe? What? Here, behind the table. George, it's been left open too. Uh Ah, by somebody who knew the combination. Johnson can tear this place apart now, but I'll bet he won't find anything. Whatever there was is gone. Bill, I don't care about that. What's happened to Bill? George, yes. Whoever opened it had to know the combination, so it couldn't have just been Mr. McCoy that was here. He could have found it that way. Or he could have found somebody else here and taken the stuff out of it and headed for the DA's office. Oh, no, you know that's not true. George, if the angel was here too... Stop jumping to conclusions, both of you. Come on. You heard me no. Hasn't shown up at his office. Hasn't phoned anybody. Look, Johnson, what about asking the traffic department? They can't find him either. They're checking taxis now, but no luck so far. Hey, where are you going? McCoy's apartment. Try to get some more leads on him. George, look. Uh, McCoy. Hey, McCoy. Bill. You're wasting your time. Look at the bureau on the closet door. I'll see. Somebody sure went through here fast. No neckties on the rack. Drawers left open. Uh-huh. No razor blade. No toothbrush. George! Yeah. No suitcase in the closet, either. Somebody else must have been here, don't you think? I mean, it seems to me most likely... Hey, what are you doing at that fireplace? Listen, Get away I'm from that... No! Yeah. Ashes. Papers. So you try to step on them and put... They're all 
old burn, whatever they are. Hey, Brooksy, shut the door. Get rid of that draft in here. Maybe I can still make out this... Yeah, that's what they are, all right. All right, Myrtle, look. Whose handwriting is that? I don't know. A second ago, I thought you were scared because you thought McCoy might be dead. Now, come on, whose papers are these? I don't know. They're burned so badly, okay, I can't Okay, you won't tell me, but I know somebody who can. Naturally, I've seen Mr. Lumpert's writing many times. Hi, Jonathan Lamb. will get much out of them, Valentine. But that's what the papers were, all right. Records of payoffs, dealing with gamblers, a whole works, whole underworld empire. Lefty Lumpert, his records. Except for one page concerning his angel. Oh, Mr. Valentine, no, it, it, it can't be true. He wouldn't His have. angel by the name of Bill McCoy. Well, it's happened before. No one in a better position to protect him. The investigator who somehow could never find anything. Until today. And then he destroyed it as fast as he could and ran. Well, that does it. I got all the evidence we need. Uh Uh-huh. All over but chasing down McCoy. And Myrtle, you'll feel different when we find him. And if we hurry, I know how to do it. Once you said I was tough, Mr. Valentine. Well, now you know why. Take it easy, take it easy. You rationalize yourself into taking a job like mine with Lefty. You deal with phonies. And the first nice guy who pays you a lot of attention. Turns out to be a phony, too. It's that kind of a word. I know, I know. You said you knew where to find it. Uh-huh. Yeah, I phoned the River Patrol to meet us. Who? Lefty Lumpert's underworld business is still really intact. Those ashes won't tip off any names or places. And it's a good business. Worth continuing. You mean... You mean you think Bill is I mean, is suppose Bill wasn't the angel. He was really a partner of Lefty? Suppose there wasn't any angel. After all, you're the only person who ever said there was one. What? Just like you made a big show of being frightened. To prove there was one, I guess. But Lefty so often If Lefty me... wasn't a lone wolf, the way everybody else figured, then the only possible associate was you. Mr. Valentine, you're I really tough, don't know all right, he... sister. Suppose that's what Murphy knew. Suppose that's what he wanted to see you about. You, the new boss. What? Suppose that's why you shot him in the alley near the hospital where he waited for you to come out. Shot him to quiet the only person who knew your real position. This is the most ridiculous oh, accusation. Oh, wait a minute. Except Bill McCoy, of course. Sure. The man who was breathing close to the truth. And that's where we're going now. To drag the river real fast before the mud and silt keep us from finding his body forever. His body? Sure. But but he was the angel. You you saw Lefty's own Private file Private secretary him. for years. That forgery would be a cinch for you. Just like you had time to murder McCoy there at the houseboat. Then tear over and fix up his apartment to look like he'd run away. Burn those papers, but leave just enough stop so we think... Stop it, stop it. I won't listen if to you. If we find his body where you dumped it, then there's no other way it could work, is there? Yes. Yes, there is. Now, you could keep on driving right across the bridge, oh, right out of town. Put that gun away, sister. And never mind attracting any attention to speeding. You see, there's no reason for me to do all those things. Why would I? Lefty was my... Where did he come from? Right behind us, sister. Head of the traffic department. I asked her to pick me up. What, you? Oh, no. Careful with that thing, sister. I'm going to ask the department to reinvestigate that accident of Lefty's, the one with you driving, because that'd explain everything, wouldn't it? If this case really had three murders. Well, Myrtle, those policemen are getting out of their car. You've only got about two seconds to make up your mind what you're going to say. You know what I'd say if I was in Myrtle's shoes? Bye. Of course, you couldn't count on it working. Not to the extent, anyway, that you can always count on this. Mr. Valentine, you don't count very well, do you? Oh, yes, I do. Three murders... Because everything that's happened would make plenty of sense. If you maybe happen to give Lefty the extra blow after that accident that supposedly killed him. Or you could have rigged the accident I by... I said you don't count very oh, God, well. Now, give me that. Oh. oh, yeah, I can still count. So can you. Three murders, I said. Not four.
First Lefty, then Murphy, then McCoy. Real tough woman, Brooksy. But she wanted to take over Lefty's empire. <laughs> Simple as that. Well, at least one thing tonight, George. I noticed this case made you stop calling me Angel. Yeah. You have just heard another adventure with George Valentine. Robert Bailey starred as George with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. A few years ago, a new slogan or slang expression was thrust on the vocabulary of the American public. You remember it. It came in very handy when the wife wanted you to clean out the attic, or your brother-in-law put the bite on you for a ten-spot. It was, quote, drop dead, unquote. Of course, it never did you any good, but it was better than 23 could do or go jump in the lake. If you listen carefully, you may get some tips on how to use the expression, with more effective results. It all started with a phone call to George Valentine's office by a little fellow who was just full of questions. Oh, well, let's see if George has any of the answers. Don't you want a story? Hold it, will you? Who is this? Jerry Yule, I said. I'm a writer and I have a story. Yeah, well, this is George Valentine and I'm not a publisher. Please listen to me. You've got to meet me right away. Captain Charlie's Neptune Palace. The old waterfront district. The captain's who's what? I live here. It's an old hotel. I'm collecting material. But this particular story, I'm afraid I don't know how it ends. And that's why I need you. Sounds to me like it goes around in a circle. I want to be there when it ends. Don't you understand? That's why I'm calling you instead of the police. Police? What kind of a story is it? Well, it concerns a mysterious stranger. And a seaman who chews tobacco. And mostly, of course, the parrot. The what? The parrot, a green and orange parrot. Ordinarily, I don't like parrots myself, such mangy, squawking creatures, but Captain Charlie, of course, will... A green to... and orange parrot. Now look, friend, and if meet you... Meet me in 15 minutes at the foot of Tide Street, please. You don't want anyone else to get their hands on this story, do you? <laughs> Well, I don't know, Mr. Yule. It all depends whether or not this story has a happy ending. And from where I sit, I'll bet you it hasn't. However, to keep things even, here's another kind of story that I know has a happy ending. Now, let's see. Uh, George and Brooksy were supposed to meet a Mr. Yule at the foot of Tide Street. Say, that's a pretty rough part of town. You better watch it, George. You might get in over your head. Is it always so foggy down here? Well, only in the summer. Captain Charlie's Neptune Palace. Quite an ornate old place, isn't it? Oh, the rooms are empty now, or most of them, and half of it is locked off, of course. It tips like a one-legged man there where the pilings underneath are sinking. The commercial docks went away and left this district, you see, when they built the new piers yeah, farther down. Yeah, I know. Beer and sandwiches. Step into the kitchen and make your own. Rooms, 50 cents. Quite a come down from the kind of hotel it must have been once. Oh, but there's no transient trade, you understand, Miss Brooks. Just the ones Captain Charlie asked to stay permanently. Like writers who specialize in foggy stories. <laughs> now, just be patient, Mr. Valentine. I want you to understand this setting, that's all. Its mood, its, its character, 
It's strange, Shut Ed. The door. Oh, hello. You want some coffee? Pour your own. Oh, don't look at me, friend. Captain Charlie, I suppose. No, no, this is Mawson. Sure, I'm not crazy. I I just look that way. The business cards, menus, and wedding announcements. That's his line. What? Why, he used to do the menus on the Lusitania, no less. Mm-hmm. Been sunk ever since. <laughs> he prints Charlie's stationery for him. Not that Charlie ever uses any, but that's how he took him in. Where's the dad coming from? Who opened the door? That's all right, Sadie. Go back to your knitting. Oh, there, that's Sadie. She used to own the place back in the gay days when it was Sadie's Neptune. Sure, place. sure, but Captain Charlie never had the heart to throw her out either. Who are your friends, you? Oh, never mind us. Who's down? All we care about is a story. Not that we'll ever get it. Oh, well, now, Morton here, he was in it. Oh, no, I'm not. Charlie, give me a check for the 25 bucks. Don't mix me up in your fiction. Parrots. Ha! Bird feathers. I said who's down there. You, Captain? Look, Buster, for the last time, will you tell us what this is all about? Come on, come on. Through here. No barroom. I'll tell you all right. Well, 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 and who might your friends be, Mr. Yule? No matter, no matter, the welcome's always out. But you know what I've been here sitting and thinking, me and Limey here? Right, Skipper and me been thinking. Be quiet. Right, Skipper. The next thing this hotel needs is a rubber plant. I remember in Bombay once, I I seen the most lovely rubber plant. Hey, wait a minute, I wanted to tell these people about last night. Oh, that. Well, now, I don't blame you. Last night, young lady, I bought the most lovely green parrot that any man ever saw. Do you know this morning he Captain, would you mind sticking with last night? What is it? What happened last night? He told you, Governor, he bought a parrot. No, 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 no. But a story should begin at the beginning. And, Mr. Valentine, the very first thing was $25. That's what woke me up. What? Right. I woke you up to borrow it, see? Only he didn't have it. And neither did Sadie, so I had to break the lock on Morton's room and dig it out of his stuff. It, that's on account of the skipper here was a little short in the cash register. <laughs> <laughs> made Morton sore, too. Made all of you sore. Oh, not me, skipper. Nobody appreciates a good parrot, young lady, but I do, and I bought him. Had to scrape up a whole hundred dollars. That's the story. But I made it, and I bought him. Limey. Run, fetch the bird. Show the people. All right, Skipper, whatever you say. I'll give you a hand in case he talks back. Ah, uh, Yule, is that all there is to it? Just that the captain bought a bird? Uh, Mr. Valentine, uh, uh, the stranger. Now, let me tell you about him. The man he bought the bird from. The mysterious stranger. Now, uh, don't look at me that way. He was. He was a foreigner of some sort. He was a Hindu or Sikh or something. One of those big fellas with a beard and a turban. Uh, but a sailor. And he and Charlie gibbered away at a great rate in some heathen tongue. Oh, now, look, friend. He wanted to get rid of that bird, the Sikh did. Act as if he was afraid of him. That's why all the fuss about the money. He was so anxious to get paid and get out. And when he left, he left a running. Well? Here, here. now wait. <laughs> here he is. Thank you, you ducky, though. Careful there, Limey. Careful he don't slip off your shoulder. <laughs> He's taking quite a fancy to Limey here, you know that? So that's the parrot. <laughs> Isn't he the most lovely bird you ever saw? Well, I wouldn't exactly say Oh, he... Limey's going to clean him up a bit. You know how it is. But here, here, let me show you. This is a piece of resistance. Now, come on, baby. Say it. Speak out for the people, oh, baby. Oh, fine bird. He talks you. That's a baby. That's a baby. Talk right up like you did to the heathen. Speak out, baby. Speak ah, out. Drop dead. Drop dead. Drop dead. <laughs> drop dead. Ah. Isn't he the most lovely thing you ever heard? Drop dead. That does it. Uh, Valentine, wait, 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 wait. Wouldn't it interest you if I told you that I took a walk this morning just before I called you and that I found the sick, that heathen sailor who was so afraid and so anxious to get rid of the bird, and that the poor man was just lying there in an alley, dead. Now, wait a minute. That man didn't drop dead. He was rolled. Look at his pocket. See for yourself. Slugged and rolled, that's all. Yeah, you're right, Lieutenant. Only whoever hit him tapped him a little too hard, Chuck. It's happened more than once down here. But don't you think it's interesting that... Uh... And never mind that Eye of the Idol mystery magazine stuff either, Mr. Yule. What I want to know is why you didn't report this to the police quicker. But here in the alley, I knew no one would find him. Besides which, 
A beard and a turban. You don't even know he's the same guy you saw last night. I think he is. Ah, there's a whole shipload of these birds in port. Can you tell them apart? Routine, that's all. Routine case, and you've got to clutter it up. Big mystery. <laughs> okay, boys, where's that wagon? Well, Mr. Yule... I wrote a story about one of these fellows... Hey, hey, wait a minute. What are you doing? Johnson will cut your gizzard out if you touch that body. You're in enough trouble as it is. Let go of me! Ah. The turban. Here. Hold that flashlight. Ah. Oh, brother. There. You see? I told you it was the same man. Whoever rolled the sailor just wasn't so bright about where he'd carry his money, huh? Uh, 60, 70... Yeah, give me that. Yeah, it's the hundred bucks, all right. No, 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 I'll keep it. Only so what? This still doesn't mean the parrot had anything to do with it. Hey, Mr. Valentine, look at this. Did you ever see an Oriental who chewed tobacco? Mm, what? A plug. Okay, so there's been somebody around here lately who chews tobacco, but... Oh, yeah, I remember. You said on the phone something about a seaman who chews tobacco. Yes, 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 a big fellow, but an American seaman. Well, where did he creep in? Now, look, Buster, you'd better spill the rest of what you know fast. I've told you everything honestly I have. He was just a seaman, that's all. I didn't get much of a look at him, but this morning when I woke up, he was peering in my window. And when I shouted, he ran. I came out to look around. That's when I found the body. And then I ran. Hmm. Well, that's a good idea. Uh, Mr. Valentine. All right. You too, Doc. Miss Brooks is still back in the car. You will out of the other way. Tell Johnson I went to get her, will you? Or some other lie? Uh, what? But I... No, no. You stay there and hold hands with Johnson. Hey, Valentine. See you later. I'm going to write a story. George, remember... He said that man in the turban seemed so anxious to get rid of the Take bird. It easy, and... Hey, Captain. Captain Charlie. Oh, this is a crazy, strange place, isn't it? That captain gives me the jitters. Ah, never mind. I don't want to see him anyway. Limey's the one who'll talk for us. A weasel if I ever saw one. But why? What can he tell you? What is it you're doing? Here we are, through here. Just check the information we've already got, Brooksy. Yeah, I'd like to weed out some of Yule's weird notions. He's about stupid enough to think that bird is some sort of weird super... Drop that, drop that. George. Relax, Angel. Up at the head of the stairs, that's all. Come on. Let's speak of the devil. Yeah. yeah. Something at the bottom of the stairs, too. Limey. It's Limey. He's dead. Drop that, drop that. You know, I've always found it pretty tough to squeeze juice from a lime. Well, that can't be true with everyone, because here's a case where somebody squeezed a limey too hard. Couldn't have been the parrot, but he might have been the inspiration. Now, uh, if you're in need of inspiration, why don't you give this a listen? If your name is George Valentine, you don't believe in the kind of story that has a parrot in it. When the parrot says, drop dead, people drop dead. The only trouble is, they do. First, a foreign sailor who sold the bird, and now the next man that the bird took a liking to, Limey. Yes, Limey is just about as dead as the sailor was. Who's going to be murdered next, George? Oh, Brooksy, cut it out, but would you? But Limey didn't just fall down the stairs. It's a dark stairway. It could have happened. Only you doubt it. Yeah, I guess he was dead before he fell. But a guess isn't good enough, is it? It's all so unbelievable, all these crazy characters. There's another and... explanation of some kind. You want to bet it's nice and simple? No. <laughs> okay, maybe not. But for instance, why is the parrot important? Why was that mangy captain so anxious to buy him in the first place? And why is Mr. Ewell so interested? I get the idea. So run out and get the police, will you? Well, what are you going to do? I want to see who's around, Angel. Mostly upstairs. Well, the bird is, for one. Yeah, I know. He hopped off down the hall. See you later. All right, George. You sure fell all right, Buster. Well, so who pushed you? Or slugged you first? Yeah. Who? Ah, get him off me! Help. What the? Help. It's Sadie! Ah. Sadie! 
City. Get him off! Send him off the scene! Oh, what? Get out that window! What? Shoot! All right, all right. Just a parrot, that's all. Just a... Of all the ugly, mean All right, take preaching. it easy, take it easy. He's out the window now, huh? Ah, sitting there on the kitchen roof like he was real proud of himself. Only what happened? Hop through here across my face. I was sound asleep. I told Captain Charlie I wouldn't stay here if he kept that bird. I never allowed parrots when it was my hotel. This was a respectable place. Sure, sure, was... but look, Sadie. Did you hear any noise out by the stairs a while ago? Maybe about half an hour ago? No. Why should I? Everybody's been out, except that awful creature. I heard them go. Why? Skip it. Only tell me something, Sadie. How long have you lived here? Forty years now, I'd say, off and on. Barring a couple of marriages. But I always come back. Oh, my lands, I wouldn't know any other place to live. None of us would. All been here for years with Captain Charlie, huh? Well, of course. Except that Yule, naturally. He's recent. We're all sort of has-beens, but... The captain, he keeps us all under his wing. He's a wonderful man. He's a generous, honest. That was what you wanted to ask about, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, Captain Charlie. Ask anybody in the district about Captain Charlie. Okay, okay. Nothing bad about anybody here, except for that bird. Yeah, well, I better get him off that roof. Well, don't you bring him back. Here, won't have that thing screaming at me. Oh, like... be quiet, Sadie. Somebody else trying to get him off that roof, too. Huh? Very popular bird. No, no, stay there. I can make it around the ledge. Just stay in your room. Easy, little boy. I'll be up there and get you in just a minute now. I keep the big trap shut, will you? Less noise now. That's huh. the stuff. Don't you know? A seaman. Baby. Would have been easier to climb up with a ladder. What? Bird watching society. You always chew tobacco when you go parrot hunting? Beat it, will you, buddy? I don't want no trouble. I don't blame you. Not on a slippery roof. Stay out of it, Mac. Hey, don't reach for that bird. I want to talk to you. I ain't the type. Stay where you are, I said. Rock that, rock that, rock that. Oh, still, you blast. Ah. Yeah, now look what you did. That's the kitchen flue he's climbing into. Now I can all have fun getting him out. Yeah, well, let him stay there. Forget him. You're the one I want. There's a little matter of people dropping oh, dead. Oh, no, you don't, Mac. I had enough. I don't want no trouble. This is where I came from. Oh, no, don't try that. Hey, you. So long, sucker. Look out. You, you'll slip. Ah! Drop dead. Drop dead. Valentine, you're the one. Oh, stop it, Johnson. Drink your coffee. Thank you for everybody here, folks. Help yourselves. The seaman isn't dead, Lieutenant. His skull wasn't fractured. So we got to wait for hospital reports before we can get him to talk. Johnson, for the tenth time, leave me alone, will you? Go solve your two murders. Have you checked all these people on when they last saw Limey? Yeah, we checked and double-checked and still haven't found anything. Okay, then leave me alone. I'll drink my coffee and think about it. Sure. First, you pocket a hundred bucks and run. Then you find something but won't say what it is. Then you... Johnson. What kind of an idea did that seaman give you? What you got up your sleeve? I'll break up this picnic and maybe you'll find out. No, but you were... I... Oh, uh... All right, all right, everybody. Get out of here. There's a genius working on a story. That's all for now. Break it up, break it up. George. All right, they've gone now. So come here, brace me, Angel. Then you can beat it, brace too. Brace you? What in the name... George, get off of that stove. Oh, it's a big one. Got a big ear, man. What? The flu. Hope he's all right. Yeah, now I can reach you. Oh, where are you, boy? Come on, come on. Oh, brother, suit, grease, and cobwebs. You mean he's been there all this time, the parrot? I hope he's in here. Hope I can reach him. Yeah. Sure, here we go. Oh, look at the poor thing. Yeah. Well, I'll clean him up a little. He'll be all right. George, what are you going to do with him? I wouldn't touch that bird if it laid golden eggs. All right, hold still, Abner. Now, Brooksy, listen. we got to find out once and for all if this bird really does have anything to do with all the crazy stuff going on here. You're sure hard to convince. Hey, hey, get off my coffee. If you're thirsty, boy, we'll get you a drink. Now, Brooksy, you go in the bar where Johnson is. Give me five minutes head start, then tell people I found the parrot and took off down the alley. Well, have all the Well, this is the only way to find out, isn't it? To see who comes after me. The bird itself can't have any value. But maybe somebody thinks it does, or... Drop that. Drop that. Oh, 
Brooksy. Now, look, just because everybody who's been around this long-nosed chicken has gotten into all trouble... All right, all right, I'll do it. But there must be easier ways to find the end of a story. Okay, bird. Let's get some of the grease off your feathers. Bird of ill omen, huh? Big mystery bird. Oh, you like that. Well, get yourself all stretched, because in about five minutes we'll go outside and see if anybody meets us. We'll find out just how dangerous it is to hang on to you when you're... Drop you know, that, drop that, drop that. Hey, hey, shh, cut it out, cut it out, will you? That's better. Drop that, drop that, huh? drop, drop. What? Hey, bird, snap out of it. What's the matter with you? Hey, Abner, come on, boy, come on. That, this, there's nothing wrong. Oh, brother. Drop dead, huh? Coffee. The coffee, you took a drink of my coffee. Brooksy. Johnson, what? John. George, listen to me. Can't you hear me? Here. Here, slap him with the wet towel some more. I'll do it. I'll do it, Captain. That you... stuff can't hurt him any. Get you and your crazy joint. Get out of here. All right. All right. Oh. You you all drink that stuff, too? Oh, George, here now. Don't move. <sighs> you told me five minutes. It was five minutes before anybody even started yeah. to look for you. Sure, sure, sure. Just me, huh? Just my coffee. We're not all dead, huh? Valentine, I regret never to mind, say. Never mind, I know. I lost it up again. An old-fashioned knockout drop. They keep them behind the bar. Naturally, they would in this kind of a place. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The bird. He's all right, George. And making a lot more sense than you are. Okay, Johnson. Somebody dope my coffee. Everybody had a chance. Everybody knew I was going to be here alone. But at least it proves that somebody right here, doesn't it? Hmm. You nominate the seaman? Yes, but why did this happen, George? We found you and the bird hadn't been touched. Hey, did or... you move me? What? Here, I'll help you. No, get no, up. don't touch me. If it wasn't the bird they were after, it was me. Only why me? What have I got that they... That got? hundred bucks. Look in your pocket. See what was taken. Yeah. I thought I had it in this pocket. Oh, the wallet's okay. Everything else? 60, 70, 80, 90. No, it's all there. Well, nobody'd commit crimes just for that amount of money anyway. No, no, of course not. So get on your feet. We start all over at the beginning. Johnson, I think better on the floor. You know, all this business could be awfully simple. Sure, Hindus and parrots and sea captains This thing and... with me could be a mistake. Limey could just have fallen down the stairs. The first guy we already know was just slugged and rolled. I think you'd better stand up, George. Okay, too far-fetched, huh? But a desperate man might hope that's the way it'd go down. Like what, man? Like why? What are you talking about? Captain Charlie's respectable, isn't he, Johnson? Honest and good with the police. That's right, for years. And the same goes for the people he's kept under his wing. Morton, Limey, Sadie. Sure, sure, sure. Charlie keeps the place clean, all right. Only, what's that got to all do right, with... now listen. A foreign sailor comes in with a parrot last night and all blazes breaks loose. Everybody's imagination dives off in seven directions. It isn't imagination that the bird was involved in every crime, though, is it? Here with you, with Limey, you took care of him, with a sailor who brought him in? Sure, and you get so wound up, you don't notice something else that was involved with everyone. What, George? The money that paid for the parrot. Huh? But you just said that dough in your pocket hadn't been touched. I thought I had it in the other pocket, that's all. But suppose while I was out, suppose the reason I was dope was to get at that money and do something with it. Now, look, if it's there, it's there. And that something was the last crime that needed to be done. From here on, the mysteries could stop. George, for heaven's sake, okay, tell us... Okay, Angel, okay, words of one syllable. Suppose in this place, one person isn't so respectable. Being fooling Charlie along with everybody else for years. And last night, Limey broke a door, a lock... Why would anybody lock a door around here, incidentally? But who are you... Because Charlie needed $25 more to make up the hundred the sailor wanted for his bird, remember? Well, Limey got it all right. He found it in Morton's room. Well? Well, Johnson, from there on, one, two, three. Morton was mad, remember? But the sailor had already gone. Then the sailor was slugged and rolled. But if it was Morton, he couldn't find the money he wanted to get back. George, Limey didn't have any money, Limey so... was a weasel. Suppose he got to asking Morton about that money he took. Suppose he caught on to what I'm catching on to. So Morton killed him, scared to death of discovery now, with one accidental murder already to his credit. All right, then came me. Do you want to bet I was dope so that 25 of that 100 could be replaced with a different 25? Holy smoke. Sure, that's right. Replaced with genuine money. George, Morton's a printer, isn't he? You got it. His press must be in the locked room. He printed menus, remember? Green ones with pictures of Lincoln and Washington and people like that on them. That's the idea. And it explains everything. A counterfeiter. 
trying to keep from being discovered. Well, come on. Don't just stand there. Martin. Hey, Martin. He was here just a second ago. He ran upstairs when you came out of the kitchen. There he goes. Martin, stop. Sergeant, Sergeant, get him. Hold it, Angel. Let the police do the rest. Hey, what's going on anyway? Look, ma'am, ain't this a lovely bird? You know, someday I'm going to get me a rubber plant and then... But, George, even if Martin did commit those crimes, it still doesn't explain everything. There's still that tobacco-chewing seaman who fell off the roof and the parrot... Hey, hey, you didn't start this story. You did. So stick around a minute, and I'll give him the rest of it. You're right, Brooksy. There are a lot of questions that still need answering. So, while George is getting his story straight, suppose we all give this story a listen. Yes, he was a counterfeiter, I understand. All he wanted was to get his $25 back. But the seaman, George, Oh, yes, yes, yes. The mysterious man chewing tobacco. Well, use a little logic. The sick, the foreigner who was so anxious to sell the bird in a hurry, didn't speak English. Yes, that made it all the more... So where did his bird learn to say drop dead? Oh. Yeah, and every clue Yule gave me about him suggested the obvious. The sick had stolen the bird and was trying to sell quickly before the guy he stole it from caught up with him. You telephoned the hospital, huh? Well, this might not be all clairvoyance, but sure. The seaman didn't want to get mixed up in any trouble, but he still wanted his bird back. Huh. His bird. And that's all there was to it? Oh, my beautiful, romantic story of the waterfront. With all those strange characters. Watch it, watch it. Don't get carried away again. Oh, dear. My beautiful story. Anyway, cheer up, Mr. Yule. Maybe you could sell it to one of those mystery shows on the radio. Sure. Call it Drop Dead. Just in case we lost you somewhere along the way, George Valentine was played by Robert Bailey and Brooksy played by Virginia Gregg. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the tale, and Eddie Dunstetter played the music. Now this is yours truly inviting you to our next visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say... Have you got any skeletons hanging in the closet? If so, dig them out and set them by the radio, because we have a dandy story that's going to make them feel right at home. It's called Uncle Harry's Bones, and it's complete, all except for his floating ribs he lost somewhere between 18th and 19th on Chestnut Street. Now, where they keep Uncle Harry's mortal remains, only time will tell. Besides, George Valentine has to have something to do for the next little while. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to go around saying, let George do it which would not be good, since that is his aim in life. Anyway, if the maestro will throw us a bone in E-flat, we'll get on with the epic. My dear Mr. Valentine, 
You will please report to me at the Stedman Farm. That's two miles down the road from Pine Lake if you turn right at the Red Silk Post Office or the house with the unpainted shutters if you come over the hill. I want you to clearly understand that you're working for me, no matter what anybody says. And Lordy knows the people around here know how to say things. For instance, they all say Uncle Harry is their uncle, but he's not. He's mine, and nobody else's. Mr. Valentine, please come quick. My trouble is, I don't know if Uncle Harry is Uncle Harry, or somebody else's who's not important. I've got to find out, now don't you think? Sincerely, Sophie Sturdivant. <laughs> Hey, friend. Hey, you. What's your trouble? Hello. We're looking for the Sturdivant place. Oh, well, down the road, past the hill. You're looking for Doc Sellers. He's just gone into town, I think. Doc Sellers? Who's he? No, it's Sophie Sturdivant we wanted to see. Oh, Sophie. Her. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Eh, nothing. Doc's her brother. He's all right. Well, what's the matter with her? Nothing. Okay, thanks. Look out for your foot. Hey, hold up, hold up. Don't see many strangers around here. Where are you from? Looney Bin? Uh, Looney Bin? Sure. Uh, Sophie's all right. What are you driving at, Buster? My name's Dorky. What are you driving at? Say, tell me something. Where does Sophie's Uncle Harry live? Who? Uncle Harry. Some kind of a character around here, I gather. Nope. No Uncle Harry around here. But she wrote... Uh, Look, this is a nice, peaceful place. People don't like strangers making trouble. None of my business, none of yours. Let well enough alone, I say... You'll live longer. You know what I'd do if I were George? Go back to town. Ah, but not fearless Valentine. Besides, he's got Brooksy there to help him. Just like I've got this to help you. Now let's see if George and Brooksy took the old-timers' advice to get out of town. Nope, I guess they didn't. Because there they are, walking up to Sophie's front door. It's kind of a run-down place, isn't it? And all the places around here seem to be, George. Yeah. Mrs. Sturdivant? The door's open. She's probably out back in the kitchen. Uh-huh. Mrs. Sturdivant? Sophie! Hmm. She's not in the kitchen, George. Of course she isn't. Huh? Oh, what do you think does the cooking around here, anyway? Oh, hello. Yeah. We didn't mean to walk right in. must be Doc Sellers. Well, I ain't Abraham Lincoln. You looking for Sophie? Uh-huh. I'm George Valentine. This is Miss Brooks. I've seen your car out there. Just come in myself. Hey, sis! Come to the party. You're a doctor, are you? Sure, sure. <laughs> Want a pill? <laughs> Here. Oh. <laughs> Pretty good size, eh? <laughs> no, I haven't practiced for years, but I still got these. I was over trying to unchoke a neighbor's horse yesterday. Eminent sawbones, that's me. Uh Uh-huh, you're a vet. Yep. (laughs) Retired livestock killer. Sophie! Hey, so! Uh, Upstairs, I guess, working on a butterfly collection. Come on through. Sophie, for the love... She must have fallen down the stairs, George. I'm all right. I'm Here, all right. get her over to the couch. I'm all right. Clumsy ox, what'd you do, trip over your own feet? Oh, yeah, let me. She didn't fall downstairs. Huh? Yes, I did. That's what I must have done. But how did your face get those blotches on it? How'd you get that black eye? No one hit me. What'd you say that for? I mean, I, I fell, that's all. Look, did somebody slap you, knock you no, down? No, 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 no. Well, who was it? Why? When did it happen? No, stop it. Stop it. We've come to help you, Sophie. So I want you to tell us what... Oh. Huh? Well, what are you looking at me for? No reason. Just wondered why she's still so scared. Oh, no, that's ridiculous. Doc's my brother. Oh, hey, Douglas! Douglas, come on in here. Is Douglas with you? Yeah, just got back from looking at the old office. Oh, what did you find? Nothing, not a blame thing. Oh, look, both of you, what are you talking about? Yes, Doc, what is it? What do you want? Hey, Valentine, Miss Brooks, Douglas Kent. Just says your law, I'm not the kind of man who beats up his own sister. Uh, how do you do? Hi. I... Sophie, what's happened? I'm all right, Douglas. Doug, here's another crazy eager beaver like Sophie is, Mr. Valentine. Going off half cock whenever mm-hmm. he gets... Mr. Valentine's here to help us. Isn't that right, Sophie? He's here to help find out. Oh, look. Will somebody please explain what this is all about? 
No. No, I I think that perhaps I was wrong. What? Mr. Valentine, I shouldn't have been so hasty in writing. Uncle Harry, that's what it's all about. Uncle Harry? No. No. Douglas and I only thought... Oh, be quiet, so You started it, let's finish it. Come here, I'll show him to you. Show him? Uncle Harry, the great Uncle Harry, so they say. Yeah, see for yourself. <gasps> oh! Skeleton. Nothing but a skeleton. Uncle Harry's bone. Says you. I was out fishing in the lake, Mr. Valentine, and my line got tangled, and here he is. But just a skeleton. I don't see how you can tell. Who was Uncle Harry? Man disappeared five years ago. Man who bought out the breeding farms, a hermit. Sophie's uncle. Uh Uh-huh. Well, look, I don't know much about anatomy, but is a shin bone supposed to look like this? Well... Go on, Doc. Tell him. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Jump to conclusions, yeah. I made the mistake of remembering that I once set a fracture for Harry, that's all. It's what I get for playing M.D. We've been downtown looking for the x-rays in Doc's old office. We were going to the barn, too, to check in his old trunks and things. You see, I thought that if we could find the x-ray that he took five years ago, it might give us a positive way of identifying... Bones are bones. It's not going to tell you anything. How about this? Piece of rusty wire tangled around his leg. George. The lake is full of stuff. It don't mean anything either. It would mean something if we knew his leg was tied with wire before he died. Exactly, Mr. Valentine. That's just the way I... Hey, see, everybody who reads mysteries goes off half-cocked. Well, what kind of a skeptic are you, Doc? Why don't you think it's Uncle Harry? Mister, I don't think one way or another. Only lots of people come up summers to fish in that lake. Could be practically anybody. Okay, Doc, I'm going to go with you to keep looking for that x-ray. Douglas, get the local sheriff up here as fast as you can. And tell him to send for a police x-ray man, too. Brooksy, take care of Sophie. Look, I- I'm just as upset about Sophie as Don't you are. Don't bother, but... Doc. I finally got the idea. It's a skeleton in the closet we're after. Well, come on, then. We're going to start opening doors. <laughs> Set the blame leg in the first place if there was a real sawbones around. Last a bunch of recluses in this part of the woods. Yes, sir. Did you try this box here? Old Sears Roebuck catalogs. Yeah. Blasted cobwebs. Hey, how about the tin one? Uh, oh, yeah, let me see. Your x ray stuff ought to be boxed up somewhere that you could find hey, it. Hey, Doc, where are you? Oh, is that you, Sheriff? Right here. Uh, may I meet Mr. Valentine? Worse than cleaning out an old attic. Why? Don't stick your paw at me, young man. Wow, wow, wow. What's your trouble, Sheriff? Don't you like to know what's going on in your territory? You know all about it. Don't need any city boys to come telling me what my job is. Uncle Harry disappeared five years ago. Let's leave him that way, I say. Uh huh. You're not interested in skeletons, huh? Sheriff, I think I'd like to have a little talk with oh, you before quit we. Put your blab and give us your pocket knife. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just airtight box. Maybe you've got it. I. Don't know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that looks like negatives. Hey, look out for that spider. Yeah, open up closets. Got to expect being bit. Here. Let's see. Uh huh. Oh, that's that's a horse, isn't it? Uncle Harry, horse, spider. What difference does it make? Uncle Harry, there you are. Yeah, name, date, chin bone. Yeah, that's him, all right. Here, let's get it in the light. Well, Doc? Well, it could be the same as the skeleton. Yeah, looks the same to me. Set crooked on top there. Like a hundred others, I suppose. Holy smokes, Mr. Valentine, I can't tell for Sheriff, sure. did you get that police x-ray man? Yeah, over at the house. Mr. Kennedy. Okay, give me that x-ray. Come on. Absolutely. There's no question about it. But isn't it true lots of people have broken bones, Kennedy? I'll be glad to swear before a jury that this is the same bone. Before a jury? Of course, Mr. Valentine. Hasn't anyone here noticed the fracture in the skull? Mm. Here, right here. No. Enough to cause death, I should say, in that location. I will also testify that the fracture must have been made before the body became a skeleton. In other words, the x-ray proves it's Uncle Harry. Precisely. Precisely. 
and the combination of fracture and wire around the legs unquestionably proves that he was murdered. There you are, quite simple. Murder. I knew it was Uncle Harry, all right, Sheriff, but the important thing is who did sure, it. Sure, sure, Sophie. Now me and Mr. Mallantyne have... Wait a minute, to... listen to her. Young it. lady, I've known Sophie for years, and anything... But she that knows you... who killed him. She what? Of course I do. And I always knew it had happened, too. And that's why I hired you, Mr. Valentine, to catch him. Somewhere in Manitoba, Canada, I think, was the last place. You know, he sends me checks. You see, that's because he feels guilty about the way he treats me. Gary was a skin flint, a miser, a bloodsucker. I've sent descriptions. I've had detectives after him lots of times, but they've never been able hey, to catch him. Wait a minute, him. wait a minute, please, she, both of you. She's talking about her husband, George, her second well, husband. He only married me because of Uncle Harry's money, and I was the relative, but Uncle Harry was too smart for him. He'd never give him any. Oh, no, not him. Sophie, why do you... Bunker, his name is, and when you find him, you'll hang him, won't you, Mr. Valentine? I know Bunker did it. He always said he got Harry's money, and five years ago he did it, don't you see? And then he disappeared. Hold it, hold it, would you please? This Bunker, what happened? Was he a husband that ran away from you? <gasps> I beg your pardon? I sent him away, don't you understand? He was no good, and I sent him away. That's why I'm using my first husband's name. Bunker was a lying cheat, and he killed Uncle Harry, and I sent him away before I knew what he'd done. <laughs> well, get him, that's all. Get him and hang him. <laughs> And now, Valentine, will you listen to the voice of reason for a minute? Bunker ran away from Sophie in San Francisco, but it was two months before Uncle Harry disappeared. Oh. Sophie's just a little cracked on the subject, that's all. As I figure, Bunker's the one person probably didn't kill Uncle Harry. Forget him. What do you mean? Lonely area around here. Anything can happen. Nobody will be able to remember. Five years is a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I understand it all now. It isn't just the skeleton in her closet, is it? Nope. Yeah, Sophie wanted me to prove it was Uncle Harry so she could prove it was her no-good husband who did it. Instead, now we've got to solve a five-year-old crime that everybody else would have to have hushed up. Because everybody in the whole area is a suspect for murder. You know who'll get the last laugh? <laughs> Uncle Harry's bones. <laughs> Now, tell me, how is that possible? For Uncle Harry to start laughing, that is. It isn't. Not unless all that's left of Harry is his funny bone, which is a nice, happy thought. However, in case it didn't hit you quite right, here's something that's not off the elbow. It seems your client, Sophie, is the only one who ever liked Uncle Harry. Everyone else, including the sheriff, would prefer to let sleeping dogs lie. And if your name is George Valentine, you know how hopeless it will be to try to solve a five-year-old crime when everyone in town is a suspect. Sheriff Harry was a miser, wasn't he? A hermit and a miser. What are you getting at? I don't know. Gold. Misers have gold, don't they? Of course they do. If they're smart, like Harry was. Well, sure, that's why he was killed, I guess. What do you mean? Well, most of his money was in property. But people always said he had a good many thousand dollars stashed away somewhere. Somewhere like where? Ooh, up around that place of his. I could never find any, and I'm the one who boarded the place up after he disappeared. Well, Uncle Harry's place, you mean, you mean there's a house, a farm or something? It's a cabin. Nothing but a cabin. Well, come on, Brooksy, what are we waiting for? It's about a mile around the lake from here. I boarded her up solid in case he ever came back. George, what about Sophie? Never mind her. Now I know who smacked her. Hmm. 
Not much of a cabin for a rich man, is it? No. Yeah. I don't know. At least he kept it neat and clean. Turn your flashlight over here. Oh. Just a desk, that's all. You think there's any point in going through it? Not if you're looking for money. Listen. Oh, it's just the wind, I guess. Hey, wait, Brooksy. What? A brick out of the fireplace. Yeah, a nice little hole underneath. Hmm. Maybe Uncle Harry did have some money. Sure, of course he did. What's the matter? Hole in the mattress. Place for a box. Or... Hey, look out. Oh, I tripped. <laughs> well, there's nothing funny about it. Yes, there is. Loose board, ain't it? This place is honeycomb with old hiding spots. Yeah. All of them empty. Look. Look, here's a coin. This one wasn't empty. I mean, once upon a time. None of them were from the looks of it. I mean, that doesn't quite make sense, does it? What do you mean, George? You know, with the kind of tough old guy that Harry must have been. I don't... Duck, duck, Angel. What? Get down, get down. Turn off that flashlight. George. Take it easy now. This is who I think it is. The man with the shovel. I can see him in the Shh. doorway. All right, shut the door, Buster. There's a draft. Uh, Never you... mind the match. George, look out for the shovel! Get away from me! Get away from all right, I guess now we can have some light, Angel. Well, it's our neighbor. What's your name? Dorky, that right? Let go of me. Sure, sure, I'll let go. The man who warned us away, the man who said Sophie was the just The man who ridiculous. warned Sophie away, you mean? What? I did not. You got mad and hit her, too. That's assault. Now, look, listen to All me. All a matter of geography. I remember what she wrote me about the two roads. And Doc Sellers and Douglas went to town this morning. That's in the other direction from your place by the hill. So how did you know that Doc had gone to town? He wouldn't have gone past you. That's the wrong direction. So I guess you knew he was gone because you'd been over there. Sophie herself must have told you where he was. All right. Don't prove anything. No, but your shovel does. I wondered why a guy who'd committed murder five years ago would be stupid enough to commit an overt act today. Murder? Now, look, I hated Uncle Harry, I sure, but I... didn't say you did, did I? Relax, relax, Buster. You're just a little greedy, that's all. Come digging for the miser's cash. George, I don't understand. When people thought Uncle Harry disappeared, they'd naturally assume he took his loot with him. Now it seems he was murdered. That makes it a little different. Nobody alive would be smart enough to kill him and find all of it. An old cowhide skin flint like that. I know, I know. That's why you wanted Sophie to stop raising alarm. If everybody knew for sure Uncle Harry was dead, why, you'd get trampled in the rush up here. He built me out of some of my property. You can't blame me Buster, for Buster, I'm he... not blaming you for anything. That's not my job. Now get out. Go on. Go home. George, what on earth... Come on, come on. You heard me. There isn't any gold around here. Well, what's the matter, Angel? Don't you understand? We're all through with this case. <laughs> Go on, Doc. Oh, uh, sure, coroner. There's not much to say. I've given my testimony. He's identified the body. That's all we need from Doc Sellers. Well, Sheriff, who has got something to say? I understood this fellow, Valentine, had caught somebody up at Uncle Harry's shack. I know this isn't a court, but we sure want to hear everything that... I haven't got anything to add, coroner. No, see here, Valentine. No, no, coroner. I'm all through with this case. Yeah, I'm on my way back to the city. Valentine, Valentine. Yeah, yeah, what was the idea back there at the, at the inquest? There's no idea, Doc. Well, see here, if you think our sheriff is kidding. The sheriff's well, all right, Douglas. Yeah, big compliment. He yeah, only wishes it were true. All right, now listen, all of you. Uncle Harry was a heel. The whole town wished him dead. Sheriff, when the skeleton was found, your idea was to let sleeping dogs lie, huh? Well, not exactly, but holy smoke, we gotta live with the people, you know. This place has been pretty nice for the past five years. Well, then? We'll take care of Dorky, all right. For but... assault, that's all, Sheriff. That's your business. Yeah, but now I got a murder to solve. You help get this rolling, you can't just walk all off. All right, and... all right. Keep your shirt on, Sheriff. You won't have to nail anybody in your town for murder. But you said that the... Well, mur- let's start at the beginning. Five years ago, Uncle Harry, the hermit, the miser, the boy with the gold. Somebody comes and tries to get his gold. Kills him, takes his gold. But you've been up to the cabin, Sheriff. How did the killer find all the loot? 
in at least three separate hiding spots. Well, he could have twisted the old boy's arm or dug around. Nothing was he... disturbed. He went right to the spots. Yeah, I remember. And if he got rough with Harry, would Harry have told him where all the spots were? Well, no. I see what you mean. No, you don't, Douglas. Maybe Sophie's an unhappy, bitter woman, but uh, she had the right idea. Sheriff sent some telegrams to, uh, where was it she got her last money order from? Someplace in Manitoba, Canada? Bunker, that, that no good husband of ours, he's the one. Bunker? Well, I grant you he could have come up here after he left Sophie in San Francisco. I guess nobody would have known if he was out at Harry's place. Yeah, but she's had detectives looking for Bunker, tracing those little, those little money orders he sent once in a while. Well, that's right. They ain't been able to find him, Valentine. Okay, okay. But, Doc, you wouldn't be able to lie about x-rays of anybody who's still around here, would you? I mean, right out in public court and all? No, 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 you couldn't do that. You'd be caught up. What are you talking about? Perjury. I waited just long enough for you to commit perjury at the coroner's inquest, Doc. Well, what are you... What are you talking about? A tin box with a live spider in it. Spider? Yeah, that's what gave me the idea, and it's the only way to explain everything. Suppose the spider got in there when the box was open, say, a few days ago. By Doc alone. You're crazy. No more than your sister is. Suppose you switch some x-rays. We'll tie that together with what I said about Uncle Harry's hiding places. There's only one person who could have gone right to the hiding places. And that's Uncle Harry himself. No, now look. But he couldn't do that if he were dead, could he? All right, then. Suppose Doc here once treated a fracture for Bunker. Bunker? Yeah. Oh, boy, that would... Yeah, hey. simple as that. Five-year-old crime. Man killed another man, threw him in the lake. And now, because his sister would inherit some property and so on, Doc decides to make the skeleton into Uncle Harry, when it's really the skeleton of Bunker. That's not true. Now, Sheriff, you've got to believe Perjury, me. Perjury, Doc. Do Perjury, remember? Uh. But, Sheriff, I think the reason detectives haven't been able to trace Bunker is pretty simple now, don't you? Wrong description. Just send a description to Canada of Uncle Harry. They'll get him all right. <laughs> and there you are, Sheriff. Instead of just a bunch of bones... Uncle Harry is a real live murderer. Uncle Harry? Well, I'll... Hey, Valentine, wait a minute. Where are you going? Back to the gal what brung me. Sophie. Yeah, there's a lot more important stuff to clear up in this case than dead skeletons. Yes, yeah, Sheriff, I got a live client to drag out of her closet. A gal who hired me and then slammed doors in my face. Why? Well, in a couple of seconds, I'll find out. You know, I'm kind of sorry for old Sophie. I've got a feeling that when George gets through with her, she'll be sorry the story wasn't called Aunt Sophie's Bones. But while we're waiting for the worst, let's give a listen to the best. He hated Harry. Bunker hated Harry. Sure, Sophie. He must have come here to get some money out of Harry, and, well, Harry defended himself, I guess. It's been sweet of Uncle Harry to send me the money orders all this time. Even if it is trapping you. Mm, I wouldn't be too sure it was sweet. It's kept the illusion that Bunker was still alive. He'd do that on purpose. Oh, yes. Perhaps. In fact, I wouldn't be too sure you love that uncle as much as you claim. I think you just hated Bunker. But now Bunker's dead. Now you know he's dead. People can waste a lot of time hating, can't they? Oh, Sophie, I'll tell you something. You wasted a lot of our time before I caught on why you hired me, then didn't want to talk. Well, I, I told you you were working. Well, I didn't think it was just Dorky's getting rough. It was the fact you began to remember whose leg had really been fractured, wasn't it? Well, I, I couldn't understand what the doc was up to. <laughs> I'm so glad it was only perjury. Makes me feel much better. He'd been willing to wait another two years. You might have had Uncle Harry declared legally dead and collected his property that way. Yeah, but Doc wouldn't wait, that's all. Too good an opportunity. <laughs> and the ironic part is, if it had worked, Uncle Harry couldn't have done anything about the inheritance slipping away from him. Not without admitting the whole story. Well, I can see why Doc was tempted, all right. Doc hated Harry. Such a waste of time. And you said that before. About hatred being a waste of time. I collect butterflies, you know. People say I have about as much brains as one. 
But anybody who wastes time is uh, crazy. Yeah, yeah, sure, butterflies, I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> He's stupid, isn't he? <laughs> Doesn't learn any lessons from seeing what happens from, from an unhappy marriage. Don't worry, Sophie, I'm the teacher. Well, but what is this? Come along, George. Time to say goodnight. Oh, now you haven't seen my butterfly collection. You come upstairs with me and I'll show you my real prizes. <laughs> Well, you can hang Buster back in the closet now. It's all over. Oh, but before you do, be sure to tell it that uh, George Valentine was played by Robert Bailey and Virginia Gregg played Brooksy. The story was written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, and Eddie Dunstetter dug up the music. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. I wonder if the time will ever come when George Valentine runs into a problem that's even too big for him to handle. So far, he's been lucky. But you never know. Take this uh, Peter Van Rassel that he's about to tangle with. Peter is one of those charm boys with an accent who just arrived here from Rangoon. He looks like the type of character who could handle himself under almost any circumstances. But he must have hit a snag. Because right now, all Pita has in mind is let George do it. My dear Mr. Valentine, my name is Peter Van Russell. I'm a research chemist for one of the rubber companies with offices in Rangoon. I have devoted my life to my work, which I suppose to someone else would be about as dull as my own person. It has been years since I have even followed the American newspapers, let alone kept abreast of your customs. I have never been in your city before. Now, I say all this so you will understand how impossible it is for me to find, to locate, a certain man without your help. A man who, like myself, has just arrived from Burma. A man who is here, but is not here. It is a debt of honor, you understand, purely a personal matter. I must see him. I only have a few days before I, I return to the jungle. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Van Rossel. You said this man is here, but he isn't here. No, I assure you, it is just as confusing to me as it is to you, Miss Brooks. Well, to start at the beginning, what's this man's name? Uh, Hollowell. Terence Hollowell. Uh -huh. He's uh, always about 40 years old. Tall, quite distinguished. Oh, well, uh, does he live here? Did you look him up in the phone book? Oh, yes, yes. He maintains a residence. Well, then what... Now, I telephoned, you see, from my hotel, and I was informed by a caretaker that Mr. Hollowell won't be arriving from Burma until tomorrow. Well, okay. Then he just hasn't got here yet. Now, yes, he has. I came by plane. I'm sure he was at least a day or so ahead of me. Here. Now, that's a little torn. Uh, cablegram. Van Russell, Pan Am, Honolulu. Was waiting for me at the airline's office yeah, in Hawaii. Let me Hawaii. see that. Waste of time, you're trying to contact me. Well, right in detail, but assure you that under present circumstances, our meeting one another would be needlessly painful to you. A stroke of fate, that's all. Please understand, Terence Hollowell. Now here, this, this piece here, you see? That cablegram was sent from this city. He sent from here. So he is in town. Yet... 
at his house, they insist he is not. He is here and he isn't. <laughs> uh, Mr. Van Rossel, apparently this man doesn't want to see you wherever he is. Uh, what sort of person is this, Hollowell, anyway? Oh, a traveler, a, a lecturer. You know, most charming fellow. He stayed with me for a week or so at my plantation north of Rangoon. No, but so easy going. Not the sort to be mixed up in anything troublesome, you know. And you have no idea what he's talking about in that cablegram? No. And I think I should find out, don't you? There is a pearl necklace. Ten black pearls and a necklace. What's that? Well, that's the only thing I can think of. Hollowell is a man who admires beauty. I helped him to obtain a necklace, that's all. Oh, it's valuable. He paid nearly every penny he had, nearly $2,500 for it over there. So it's worth a lot more here. Oh, yeah, yeah. But what could be that... Yeah, I understand you, Mr. Van Rossel. What could have happened to a perfectly nice guy that made him disappear and yet not disappear? Yeah, precisely. Only what do I do when and if I find him? What is it you wanted to see him about in the first place? Oh, naturally, Mr. Valentine, I will explain anything you wish when the time comes. But right now, the urgent question seems to be, why is Terence Holloway trying to hide? And most important of all, where? You know, if I had a monster like this Peter on my trail, I'd hide too. This boy spells trouble with a capital T. But then George is smart. He'll know what to do. And if you're smart... You'll know what to do when it comes to this. Now let's see how George is doing in his search for old Terrence. I guess so far, not so good. And Brooksy isn't being a bit of help either. George, Mr. Van Rossel has already tried calling the house here. I, I can't see any reason Always for Always start trying. with the obvious, Angel. Maybe this Hollowell just doesn't want to be bothered with our Dutch friend. You know, look me up sometime, and then the people take you up on it and you're stuck. But... He was his guest in Burma. He wouldn't be rude. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Are you from the house here? I mean... It uh, seems so unusual. All those wonderful little birds out at this time of morning. Don't you think? Well, they should be sleeping in the middle of the day. Yes. But it's not hot, is it? There's no reason for them to be sleeping here. <laughs> Oh, we just wanted a few... Oh, uh... my, no, no, I'm not from the house. No, no, indeed. You see? I have my umbrella. Uh, yes, I see. Yes, uh, this is Mr. Hollowell's house, though. I only carry my umbrella from habit, I suppose. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Uh, you haven't rung the bell yet. Yes. Yes, it's Mr. Hollowell's house. It's his. It's not like him, though, do you think? We've never met him. Oh. Oh, you've never heard him talk. You've never heard the beautiful words he uses. It was such a sad expression. But so exciting. All the romantic places. The intimate, beautiful thought. What did you say? Oh, no, I haven't rung the bell, no. You may if you wish, but it won't do any good. Why not? She's at home. Perhaps she'll throw you out like she's at me. What? His wife, Mrs. Allowell. Yes. His wife. Oh, don't mind me. I'm just waiting. Just waiting. Who hired that maid? I asked you, who hired that maid? Lisa, for heaven's sake, please. Not a day I... over 18 and straight out of a model agency, if you ask me. You've seen her. How could any man help seeing her? But I tell you, George, I listen. didn't. Yeah, then who the maid did said to wait in the hall. But... I won't have her around the house. I did not, Lisa. Now, please, why do you care? It's not your house anymore. You get your separation checks. That's all. That's that why I'm here. I haven't had a check for two months. You've been holding out again. There isn't any money, I tell You're you. You're lying. Oh, Lisa, darling, I couldn't like you if I tried. Don't you believe? Ah, uh, hello. What Is anybody? Here? Oh, excuse me. Ah, oh. how do you do? Um, excuse us. I I'm Miss Brooks. This is Mr. Valentine. The maid said of to Of course, of course. Visitors all over the place. Why not? I'm Mrs. Hollowell. Oh, 
But then you must be Mr. Hall. My name is Cy Kirby. And you walked in and are offended because I make a lot of noise. All right, I don't mind. I'm a nasty woman. Mr. Kirby is my husband's business partner. He belongs here. I don't. He's the one you want to see. Uh, what club do you represent, Mr. Valentine? Uh, what club? <laughs> don't tell me you're a process server. Which one of my husband's rich women friends do uh, you... Lisa. Isn't it about a lecture? Really, that's our only business, you know, travel talks. And <laughs> I just assumed you were like the lady out there with the umbrella or the committee of women out in the hall. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, newspaper, that's all. Uh, wanted an interview. We understood Mr. Hollowell had just arrived from Burma. He won't be back until tomorrow. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, tomorrow. Oh, I see. Well, I understood he might have arrived already. No, but I'm sure Mr. Kirby can tell you everything you want to know about my husband. Uh, of course. Every bit of publicity counts. Uh huh. Well, uh, look, I wondered if we could get a picture of Mr. Oh, Hollowell. Na naturally. Delighted, I suppose. Even Burton Holmes needs a little press cooperation now and then. Uh, come along. We'll find a photograph in his desk. George, you'll never locate a man just by carrying his picture around. I will by a telephone pen, Angel. What? Yeah, it was on his desk. There's the name of an employment agency scribbled on it. It may be just a cockeyed hunch, but come on. Flavin Home Service Employment Agency. No, no, Mr. Flavin, there's nothing wrong. I just phoned you to check, that's all. So Mr. Hollowell did hire the girl himself, huh? I see. And he phoned from the Benson Hotel. Okay, thanks a lot. Now, the man in the photograph? Why, yes. Oh, yes. He's staying here at the Benson. His name is... Uh, could you just tell me what his room number is, please? Mm, 325. Oh, but his key is in... I think he's probably across the street. Uh, what's this all about, Mr. Valentine? You mean that theater over there? No, no, a little jewelry store. I've seen him go in there before. Jewelry? Yeah. George, remember the pearl necklace? Yeah. What's that? Uh, I don't know, friend. It's all too much for me. Uh, suppose we just wait. What's the matter? Give me that photograph. George. That's him, isn't it? Oh. May I have my key, please? 325. Mm-hmm. Uh, these people were just uh, asking about you, Mr. Smith. Oh, they were? Mr. Smith. Why, yes, young lady. Mind if we step over here a second? Well, no, not at all. But uh, what do you wish to see me about? It's Hollowell, isn't it? Isn't that your name? <laughs> oh, why, yes. Yeah, but who are you? I, uh, I don't understand. Neither would the clerk over there if you told him. Neither would I. No, I don't think there's any law against a man being incognito, is there? Who sent you? My wife? Her lawyer? <laughs> well, that's the obvious explanation, isn't it? She has a little trouble collecting money from you, I understand. Well, I suppose everyone has money troubles. Never mind, days. I'm not interested. But uh, what is it you want? Every minute I want less and less, Buster. Come on, Brooksy, we've done our job. Nice to have met you, Mr. Hollowell. But, Mr. Valentine, I located I would... him. That's all you hired me for, Mr. Van Russell. Yeah, the Benson Hotel. Now, you've done a very good job. Oh, wait a minute, I... wait a minute. Not so fast, friend. You said you'd do a little explaining yourself. Why he sent a wire brushing you off is another matter, and oh, I want to know. Oh, of course, yes. I said I would tell you. Well, a, a debt of honor, that's all. And I appreciate so much your finding him. I am really not concerned with whatever his little problems are. Well, then? Because I am only here from Burma, you understand? To kill him. This boy Peter is just full of good news. Wonder how he has the nerve, though, to go blabbing it to George. You know, if I were George, I'd hot foot it right over to police headquarters. And if I were you, I'd pay close attention to this. And now, back 
to George Valentine. The business of Terence Hollowell is travel talks, only from what his partner says, they're not making much money at it these days. Hollowell has trouble with his wife, too, but most of all, he's likely to have trouble with your client, because if your name is George Valentine, then you have a harmless-looking client, Mr. Van Rossell, who has just said, thanks for finding Hollowell, because now he can kill him. Hey, wait a minute, you... Van Russell gone, George? Oh, yeah, sure. Hung up and ran. But it'll take him at least 15 minutes to get over here to the hotel. Well, he wouldn't just come and kill him. Why would he tell you? Why would he warn anybody and then do it? Oh, lots of crazy people in the world, Angel. But this is no time to argue about it. Hollowell went upstairs to his room, didn't he? Oh, that's right. Okay, play it safe. Find the house detective. Tell him what it's all about. Well, as if I knew. Tell him to keep Hollowell there until I meet you. Where are you going? To try and tie this together fast so it does make sense. The jeweler's across the street, Angel. That pearl necklace is the only thing I know about that ties a would-be murderer to his corpse. Uh, yeah, yeah, beautiful. Such pearls I have never seen. You mean this is it? This one right here? Uh, yeah. Relic from the days when there was time to collect, when beauty was not rhinestones. Uh -huh. Now, look, I asked you... Ah, so even to buy something, you must be in a hurry. All right, all right. Fifteen thousand dollars. Uh... There, there, you see? Now you think it is too much. Such a hot day, you, you, you should take your time. You should sit down. No, no, I was just surprised they were for sale. Well, with Mr. Hollowell's pearls, you asked about... Now, look, he sold them to you. These are the ones he bought in Burma. I know the man who helped him get them. Oh, yeah, well, well, of course he sold them to me. Now I sell them. But he's been spending a lot of time over here. His hotel clerk said he what, was over... Why, what do you do? Make puzzles for yourself? Two days I spend making another necklace for Mr. Hollowell. That's all. A uh, cheap, bad one, culture stuff, uh, d -d -d junk. Wait a minute. You mean he sold you this one for a nice profit but got you to make an imitation? Uh, every time you turn around, it's got to be a mystery. No, 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 no. No imitation, just a bad one, that's all. Pearls, yeah, black ones, but nothing illegal, nothing to fool anyone. Nothing to fool a jeweler. <laughs> Only to fool a wife, perhaps. Huh? Ah, I know this man from before. Well, what's wrong with that? I, I fool my wife. You fool yours, don't you? So, all right, it's a hot George. day. Yeah, Brooksy. George, he's gone. Mr. Hollowell's gone. You sure? He piled some of his luggage into a cab the minute we left earlier. Oh, brother, everybody disappears. No, George, the starter remembered the address, or at least enough of it. Well, where did Hollowell go? His home. The big travel expert's gone home, that's all. <laughs> Such a strange thing to do. Such goings on, lady. This, this, George, you should put in a mystery show. Mr. Valentine, I'm so sorry I was rude this morning. Oh, not at all, Mrs. Hollowell. Drew here, please. He's unpacking now. And look here. He brought me this. Hmm. Pretty necklace. Oh, you already noticed it. But see, it's real black pearl. Nice husband. He bought it with his last penny in Burma. I know it was because Cy keeps the books and he told me. How could I stay angry at a husband like that? Oh, Terrence. Terrence, darling. Yes, my dear? I, uh, I won't keep him long, Mrs. Hollowell. <laughs> and he wants to kill me, you say, Van Russell. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine his even being here. Sure. It's very amusing. He's insane. Of course you know that. Lived in the jungle too long. Nothing but work. I think it's very amusing the way your wife fell for the phony necklace, too, Buster. What's that? Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to tell her. She'd start worrying again about that pretty maid you hired. <laughs> <laughs> How much does your partner, Cy Kirby, know about that little profit you made on the necklace? Buying it for 2500 Buying? Well, didn't you? In Burma? The real one? Or is that what Van Rossell is upset about? Something to do with that necklace? Oh, get out of here. You've given me your little warning, and thanks very much. 
Goodbye. Oh, no, no. My curiosity gets bigger and bigger the more this I talk. This is my house. I've done nothing criminal. I got out of here, I said. I'll get it, George. Hello? Oh, George, it's Lieutenant Johnson. Yeah, I asked him to call us here. Yes, Lieutenant. Yes? Mm Mm-hmm. George, they finally found Von Russell. They picked him up at 5 o'clock. He's been watching that hotel of Hollowell's all afternoon. Oh, give me that phone. Hello, Johnson. Let me talk to that guy. No thanks for picking him up. No thanks for anything. All right, all right. Thanks. Well, would you... Besides, you're not going to talk to him. He just fainted. Besides, he's downtown and I'm not... What? He what? Things got hotter after you left, I guess. I'm out at the Hollowell's and, boy, do you get things turned around. That Van Russell of yours is the only one who couldn't have murdered him. Murdered? You heard me. Hollowell, the big travel and charm boy, stopped three bullets. I don't know. I barely got here myself, Valentine. Well, his wife was upset. First she was hating him, then she was... Yeah, 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 I got that. But after you left, she drove to the hotel to get some more of his baggage for him. Took the maid with her. They were the ones found the body when they came back. Yeah. Right here in this hammock. That's right. In the hammock. Yeah. What a light. Not if you did. We got the place pretty well roped off and fast, but it's big. Lots of space. Cy Kirby. Been this guy's partner for years. Says he was upstairs and didn't hear a thing. We tried it out and you can't hear oh, from wait there. Minute, Johnson, wait a minute, will you? What's the matter? Look, Johnson, I could have stopped it. I could have added up all the little tips and stopped it. Take it easy. The guy was a heel. Big, soft soap artist. Big fake. Romance with a buck. But I could have figured out why a man would tell me he was going to kill in advance. Sure, sure. A debt of honor. Look, I told you Van Rossell wasn't within my... He hired me to find the guy. He showed me a wire. But suppose it wasn't his wire. Yeah, torn. That's right. First part of the name was torn. Beat yourself with something I can recognize, will you? Look, Johnson, every little thing adds up in one direction. So funny the bird should be awake in the middle of the day, she said. Said it wasn't hot on a very hot day. Look, I know, friend. I know I'm crazy, but so's murder. We don't even scratch the edges of it, Johnson. But an umbrella does. Huh? Yeah, look. Suppose she came from Burma. Suppose Van Rossel was chasing after her, too, trying to protect her in advance, or trying to get Hollowell protected in advance to stop it. Well, the umbrella over there, can't you see it? Suppose it belongs to her. Suppose she's not a club woman, Johnson, but Van Rossell's wife. George, there she is. Yeah, I know. She's got a revolver. She's watching us. Stay where you are. All right, lady, sure. Now, don't worry. My name isn't Hollowell. I killed him. Did you know that? I know, I know. But take it easy, please. It's all over. No. No, it was all over a week ago. He told me that when he left them. But I wouldn't believe she was in love with him. Oh, George, the poor thing. No, just waiting till he got here to shoot him. Oh, leave me alone. Please, leave me alone. You are Mrs. Van Rossell, aren't you? Yes. Oh, yes, I was. I, I mean... I know. Your husband told me about Hollowell visiting you for a week. I followed him. What of it? So I'm a stupid middle-aged... I saw the cablegram that missed you in Honolulu. Get away, please. Please get away. I'm sorry, lady. I want that... All right, Brooksy, take it easy. She's shooting in the dirt. She doesn't want to hurt us. It's just Hollowell that she... Stop it, I said. Get away. Hey, that's three shots, Brooksy. And there's three in Hollowell. That makes six. All right, it's all over now, lady. You've done all your shooting. Get away, I said... Oh, brother, have I been wrong? George, she's pointing it at herself. Hey, look out! (laughs) Yeah, sure, lady. Still another shell. All right, now let's see your purse. You've got your purse, haven't you? There it is, George. She dropped it. No shells there. Guess we did some good after all, Angel. Everybody else had a motive, too. Wonder which one shot him first. I shot him. Lady, you fired your gun four times just now. There are three bullets in Hollowell. Three and four are seven. So who shot him first?
George, that's a very good question. Now, uh, how are you fixed for good answers? Oh, you want a minute to think it over. Okay. You give it some thought, and we'll give this a listen. Cy Kirby, Mr. Van Russell, he was the only one it could have been. You see the others, his wife and... Yeah, I understand, I understand, yeah. Well, I got him fast enough. He didn't have any story cooked up. It wasn't premeditated or anything. Oh, of course, of course. I think they'll be able to prove that your wife only shot a dead body, Mr. Van Russell. Yeah, I see, yeah. Uh, you don't really, do you? I mean, you still haven't told us about your wife and Hollowell and... Kirby, that was his partner. You had the one swat some difficult... Well, he'd been holding out on him. Over $10,000 profit on a necklace. The only reason Hollowell lied about his return to Kirby was to give him time to arrange for its sale without anyone knowing. It's been going on for years, apparently. This time, Kirby caught up with him. Oh, it wasn't really that, though. It was Mrs. Hollowell. No matter how mad she got at her husband for carrying on with other women, no matter how many times they separated, she always went back to him. And Kirby couldn't stand it. He loved her, too. It's always love, one way or another. The same as your coming after your wife, even after she'd left you. I suppose there will be a trial. I suppose my wife... Well, there will... certainly will be an investigation. Maybe about shooting somebody who's already dead, but... Why won't you talk about your wife? Why won't you tell me what I want to know, that silly business of the necklace that kept confusing us? That was a wedding present I gave to her years ago. She gave to him. That's all. Nice guy, Hollowell. Yeah. But your wife, I mean, she knows that you came after her trying to help. She knows what you're really like, or she wouldn't have tried to kill Hollowell. Don't you understand that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is a dull place we live in. And I am not much excitement myself, not glamorous like United States. No. We work it out somehow. Don't worry so much. Goodbye. Ah. What was that line of yours, Brooksy? One way or another, it's always love. Go on, darling. There's nothing I'd rather hear you talk about. You have just heard No Escape from the Jungle, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Our story was by David Victor and Jackson Gillis, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> Personal notice, dangers by stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Well, you all set for another visit with Valentine? Ready or not, here he comes, and is he loaded. Now, uh, don't get me wrong. I don't mean in the true sense of the vernacular, nor is he toting a tommy gun. He's just up to his chin in bliss. You know why? He's going on a vacation. Now, whether you think this is the proper time of year to take a vacation, or whether you think he deserves one, is of no consequence to George. He just got tired of letting George do it. And packed Brooksy and his bags into the car and took off for his favorite seaside spot. Now, at first glance, this may look a little on the dull side, but stick around. It's only the beginning. Fish stew. 
George, are you sure this is the right road? It's so dark, all I can see is fog and sand. Yeah, I know, and they're both the same color. Now, don't worry, I can tell them apart. I tell you, Brooksy, the Italians call it Giopino, and the French call it Bouillabaisse. But this stuff here tastes so much I better know. than what they... I know, and Miss Gallagher just calls it fish stew. You've only told me about it ten times. Well, now, look, everybody else in the world gets a vacation. Why can't I? At least once a year, can't we go off somewhere George, and have I'm some fun? George, I'm not complaining about a vacation. I think it's wonderful. No mysteries, no letters from people getting murdered. But, I mean, it's so silly just picking up and going someplace you happen to be once where they have fish stew. Oh, but, Angel, you haven't tasted it yet. Besides, I wrote to her, didn't I? Huh. Still like to know why she didn't answer. Miss Gallagher? Well, that's right. Why look on the gloomy side? Maybe she's in poison at her own cooking. Oh, darling, if I sound like a gloomy... Gu- What's the matter? Road sign. Oh, I guess I'd better powder my nose, hadn't I? Sandy spit. One mile. Yep, almost there. Fog's clearing a little, too. Mm, here comes the moon. Looks cold, doesn't it? <laughs> Sandy spit, I don't blame you. Even the name of the place is crazy. But it's quiet. Nothing ever happens here. Nobody ever comes here. Aren't there any tourists or summer visitors? Uh, not many. You've seen the roads. Just sand fleas and seagulls, mostly. Oh, a few artists or hermits, maybe. But I think most people are afraid of this kind of country. Too lonely. Just miles and miles of sand dunes and Yes. Wind. George, I take it all back. I think I'd like something warm and friendly like a fish stew. The place looks totally different, you know, in the daytime. I mean, when the sun's up. Well? Oh, well, hello. I was looking She's for... not in. Uh, yeah, I was going to say Miss Gallagher. Well, obviously, I'm not her, am I? My name's Dr. Crowell, and you can take my word for it. She's not in. Good night. Well, uh, uh, you see, we're down to visit. She might not remember, but Mr. Valentine here wrote for reservations, only she didn't answer, so I'm not got... surprised. Probably wouldn't answer if you were standing in the same room. What? She don't take in guests anymore. I'm the only one left. And the way things are going, I won't last much longer. Well, what's happened that changed? Or am I wrong? Sure, sure, you're not here for hospitality, are you? Wasting my time, aren't I? What on earth are you talking about? Like of? all the rest, just nosing around. Well, I'm not going to show you no gold cup. Uh, gold cup? For my money, it ought to have stayed buried another 300 years. And Gallagher along with it. Her and her big secrets and mysteries. Yes, and you too. You should all be dead. Now, that's what I call a fine example of seaside hospitality. I think George better give up the idea of fish stew, or he'll end up dead as a mackerel. All of which makes me think that I'd better clam up and let you hear something that's not a fish story. Now let's see how George and Brooksy are making out. I don't think this little safari to the sea is going to turn out to be much of a vacation. And neither does Brooksy. Nothing ever happens in Sandy Spit. Ah, the guy's nutty. Just warm fires and good food. What I want is a vacation. You know, once a year, get away from all the puzzles and excitement and mysteries and... Oh, cut it out, Angel. It doesn't mean anything. Only, what did he say about a gold cup? George. Hey, wait a minute. Never mind. Listen. What? (laughs) Yeah, a party going on down the street. I thought everybody was a hermit in this town, like Dr. Crowell. Great party, great party. The little woman and I, we sure appreciate it. Sure yeah. do, Mr. Lewis. Likewise in space. Yeah. Come along, Clyde. Well, at least nothing so very wrong can be going yeah, on here with come people that happy. Anytime, you two, anytime. But uh, it's your house tomorrow night, eh? Oh, no, it's my house. Oh. It's such fun to get together, isn't it? Yeah, night, Miss Gallagher. Sure hey. is. Night, Miss Gallagher. Come on, George. Clyde. Hold my at hand. least I am, there's baby. our Miss Gallagher. Yeah, come on. Let's. Hey, where is she? Well, she lives back this way, so she must be coming. No, she's disappeared. And another couple, a big blonde and her husband. Where are they now? Well, you might have noticed where she went. An item like that Oh, is... come on. People don't just get swallowed up in the night. There aren't any cabins or houses out this other way, but... Miss Gallagher! Nobody here but us vacationers. Now, wait here, Angel. She must have gone this way. I'll catch up with her. Oh, Miss Gallagher! 
Miss Gallagher. Oh. Hey, what do you think you... Oh, <laughs> excuse me, Mac. Sorry. No, 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 my fault. I didn't see you uh, hiding there. What? I, I don't get you. Me, you know, just tying a shoe, that's all. I'm... Who are you? Well, now, take it easy. I'm just a visitor, that's all. Yeah, let's not kid each other, Mac. My name's Mercy, see? Clyde Mercy. Mercy Carnivals. Maybe you heard the name in better days. I even used to do a muscle act myself, see? So don't bother with no double talk. Hey, hey, what makes you so anxious? My name's George Valentine. Just going through town, that's all. Oh, oh. Well, <laughs> sure, yeah, that's the way with me, too. Yeah. Just visiting, that's all. The little wife's in training here. The long-distance swimmer, you know. That's a dead little place. Nothing ever happens. You won't have much fun. I was just on my way for a little stroll on the beach before I turn in, you know. <laughs> it was a silly idea anyway, I guess. <gasps> Huh? Oh, yes, dear. Right here. I was just... Did you see her? Baby. Did you see where she went? Please. Or did you pull another stupid Baby. thing? Baby! I... Oh. Hello. Hi. Well, uh, let's get home, baby. Time for us to be in bed. Well, good night, Valentine. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Nothing ever happens here. Come on, Angel. Down the beach. <laughs> Yes, I'm Liza Gallagher. That's that's right. Well, we didn't mean to scare you. Hey, you know, the climate must make people jumpy around here. Uh, Miss Gallagher, don't you remember my I, name? I was just us? going for a walk on the beach, but you didn't see anyone else, did you? Clyde Mercy Look, or... Miss Gallagher, what's happened to this place? In the old days, people didn't go in for parties. And afterwards, they didn't go sneaking off at this time of night to go in for... Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, but I thought I heard... Know about the old days? What do you mean? Well, I was here last year. Don't you remember? George, wait. There is somebody. Stand still. Please don't move, Mr. Lewis. It's Todd Lewis. Don't let him see us. The man who gave the party. Yes, yes, he's a sculptor. There. Now it's gone. Uh huh. Does he always go walking up the beach with a clam shovel at this time of night? Is that the secret? Y'all sneak off to dig clams? He pretended he was going to bed. That's what he told everybody at the party. Well, he could be going to that other house out there, that big, empty, lonesome place at the end of the point. Oh, no, that's rented by somebody named Brown from the city. But he's only here weekends for his health. He has a bad heart, Mr. Brown does. Besides, he wouldn't notice if anybody came walking past his place up the beach. Notice what, Miss Gallagher? <gasps> George Valentine. What? That's who you are. I remember now. You're the one who was sort of a, a detective. Well, yes, but... The post office. The post office sent you, didn't they? It was because I didn't report the fire. Hey, What's wait a minute. What's fire? And now you've come to... You've come to... Arrest me. Uh, Miss Gallagher. She's fainted. Miss Gallagher, please, start at the beginning, will you? If you feel all right, and I've convinced you I'm not a post office inspector. Yeah, yes, I'll show you. The gold cup. It's a relief to tell somebody. About a fire in the post office? Yes, yes, because I'm the postmistress, too, in this town. Use the back of the grocery store. Oh, so that's it. And there was a fire, oh, just a little tiny one. No one else ever knew about it, but that's when I found the cup. Go on. Uh, I keep a sack out for people to mail things, and everybody sends packages, sends shells or paintings, or even once that Mr. Lewis sent a whole bust of General Grant in concrete, too. Hmm. You must sell a lot of stamps. Oh, I, I didn't do anything dishonest. It's, it's just that somebody dropped a match or a cigarette, I guess, and this one package got burned, and I couldn't tell who was sending it. You know, the return address. It was all charred. But it was going to a jewelry buyer in the city. I know that because I rewrapped it and sent it on. Only pull down the blind first, will you? Hmm? Oh, here. Now, look, if this cup was in that package you sent on, then how can you show it to us now? Wait. There. There, you see? I made a cast out of it with some of Mr. Lewis's clay. It's sort of a funny-shaped cup. It was found someplace here on Sandy Spit. It must have been, because someone was sending it. Found it buried in the sand. They must have. Mm-hmm. This is just like the original? Oh, yes. You can even see the markings. Well, that's what I meant. I don't read Latin so well, but it's a good 300 years old, I guess. Spanish. It's Spanish. I looked in a book. I mean, the design and everything. And made out of hand-carved solid gold like that. You know how much it weighed, Mr. Valentine. Never mind. I get the idea. Thing that size. 
Somebody went digging for clams or fishing for a stew and made a fortune on the hall. And this is a vacation, George? Oh, Brooksy, who wants to just eat on a vacation? Who knows? In the morning, you and I might do a little digging for buried treasure ourselves. Who really found that cup, Mr. Lewis? Ah, <laughs> the $64 question. Me, I'm about as subtle as a hammer. I just ask people. And somebody's a liar? Well, would you tell? Or would you tell where? Or would you let people follow you to the right place? <laughs> nah, nah. You were a boy once yourself. Okay, okay. Some rich guy named Brown from the city owns this property. Oh, and therefore... that bird was never out here? No, no. Property lines don't mean anything where treasure's concerned. Finders, keepers. <laughs> no, no, there, see? A guy like that. Yeah, he's my choice. Ah, huh, what? Well, look, over there in the sand, taking a nap, see? <laughs> hey, come on. Let's give him a thrill. It's that carnival guy, isn't it? Clyde Mercy? Right. The one with the blonde wife? Yeah, don't talk so loud. Wind's behind us. Yeah, get around to the other side of this dune. <laughs> carnival. <laughs> Clyde's a big-time failure. I don't know how he ever snagged a babe like Kirby. Shh, easy, easy. Oh, brother. Not enough we got a treasure hunt. We have to play games, too. Well, huh? what do you come to the beach for if it's not to have a little fun? Come on. These people all take it so seriously. Here, now wait. This will wake him up. Well, it hands up, Clyde. We want the gold in your teeth. <laughs> and don't pretend you haven't found some. Yeah. Clyde's not laughing. You didn't scare him at all. He's too dead. Say, I wonder what inside information Clyde had on that buried treasure. Must have been pretty good to have someone rub him out for it. Or is that the way it happened? Well, let's give a listen to this first, and then maybe we'll find out. Back to George Valentine. Sandy Spit, a place for fleas and seagulls. But if your name is George Valentine and it's your vacation, you want to go there because of Miss Gallagher's fabulous fish stew. And then, like everybody else, you get curious about the treasure, an old Spanish gold cup that someone found buried in the sand. Only now you've found something else in the sand. The body of a man, Clyde Mercy. Murdered. Sure, sure, you don't need a diagram for that. Look, clam shovel. Hey, don't touch that. All right, all right. But it's what somebody used to smash his head with. Yeah, put up a little fight, though. Must have hit him several times. I told you people took this treasure stuff too seriously. Did Clyde hear? Huh? Oh, sure, sure, worse than anybody else. Yeah, you see his wife, the blonde, she's in training for long-distance swimming or something. She'd go trotting off in a white bathing suit every morning, and the minute she was gone, this little guy would sneak out into the dunes and start his daily prospecting. Get rich quick. Hope springs eternal. <laughs> I wouldn't be so sure. Clyde here found some gold. What? Yeah, his hand here. Look. Holy smoke. Hanging onto it for dear life. That's right. Gold coin. Spanish. About the same date as that cup. <laughs> Such a silly name. I always yelled at him so. Yeah, we understand, Mrs. Mercy. No, you don't. How could you? People like us. My third husband, you know that? And when I met him, I thought he was such a silly-looking ape, gawking at me in a bathing suit. Here, have a drink. It'll make you feel better. I married him for his money. Do you know that? That's the funniest part. He used to own a carnival, see, and I... I thought your husband was broke. Well, he lost it, naturally. No, he wasn't any good. And me and my big mouth, of course, I told him so and yelled at him, and he just got broker and broker. Until all I could think about was digging for buried treasure, huh? Sure, you got the idea. Saps. We're all just saps going around. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. What did the sheriff say, Mr. Valentine? Oh, nothing yet. 
Just that this forsaken place has a population of 73. 73, the sheriff says. 75, counting us. You want to bet the sheriff will be a lot more interested in finding out about the treasure than who killed Clyde? Look, Mrs. Mercy, why don't you go on home and stop I know, I know. Stop crying. Clyde's dead. If there's anything more I can do, I'd be Of course there isn't. I'll go swimming. That's what I'll do. What do you think I am, a baby? Oh, come on, Angel. Let's go back in and talk to Mrs. Gallagher. Now, how do I know who it is? Who cares? They're out in the back. Dr. Crow, wait! Don't get in such a lather about me. Hello, Miss Gallagher. Oh, Mr. Valentine, he's gone. He took his bag and just ran out. I told him to wait for oh, you. What are you talking about? A-, a phone just came from Mr. Brown's house. Brown? Rich guy out at the point, Angel. He's sick, remember? Oh, no, no. That's not what I mean. Dr. Crowell couldn't tell who the voice was, but, of course, that doesn't mean anything to him. He doesn't believe in mysteries and Never treasures. mind, I get it. Brown's only home on the weekends. Yeah, I remember. So then who called the doctor and why? The house is just up around to the right there. Overlooking the beach. Yeah, sure. Just wait a minute, will you? What is it, George? Hurry up, please, Mr. Valentine. I was just looking at a piece of paper. Taxi slip, see? Oh. Uh-huh. Somebody's been here, all right. Been here pretty often, too. Look, another one over here. Here's still another one. I don't... Those little slips, they tear out of the meter. That's right. And one of them's so fresh, it isn't even damp from the salt air. Come on, step on it. <laughs> Brown doesn't put the shutters up, but the place is always locked up tight. This path here? Most of the time, he uses the door back here by the shed. Wait a minute. Mr. Lewis! Hey, what are you doing out here? Well, now, that's a question I was going to ask you. Eh? Well, I'm trespassing, naturally. No, no, I just saw a man hurrying in here from across the dunes carrying a bag and wondered what was up. That was Dr. Crow. Sure, but Miss Gallagher, you wait here with Miss Brooks, will you? Come on, Lewis. All right, George. Hey, what's she so upset about this time? I don't know. Hey, the door's open. Uh Uh-huh. Back way goes through the tool shed, I guess. Front door just lets sand in in this country. Yeah. Oh, but that's not all. Yeah. yeah. Lying on the floor by the hall. Come on. Yeah, look. Doctor's kit beside him. Oh, brother. Now, wait. Don't touch him. He's not dead. I don't see any marks on him. Don't touch him. Huh? Who's that? It's Dr. Crow. Let him lie just the way he is. Wait a minute, doctor, but this guy on the floor, who's... It's Mr. Brown's house, so I guess it wouldn't be too far-fetched if this guy were Mr. Brown. Ah, boy genius. I don't need your help, gentlemen. The ambulance is on its way. Just telephone. Yeah, but who hit him? Who slugged him? Be quiet, will you? What happened, doctor? Heart attack. Yeah, I was... uh, He'll be all right. Just needed a little shot, that's all. Was it all right if I ask him a couple of questions? No. I'm no specialist, but he's sick. Now go play your Captain Kid game someplace else. Okay, okay. I guess he wouldn't answer the questions anyway. You know, Mr. Lewis, you seem to be around every time something happens. And you're the one that I saw out walking last night with a clam shovel. Everybody here's got one. There's a hundred of them, several in some homes. Any one of them could have been used as the murder weapon. Oh, sure, sure. And they all look the same. Only, uh, there's none here. I can't find Mr. Brown's clam shovel. And yet there are clam buckets, the rest of the stuff. Uh Uh-huh. There ought to be one, shouldn't there? Wait, I'll take a look at the outside lock. Yeah. Yeah, hasn't been touched. Ones in front of the house haven't been either. Okay. So if there was a clam shovel in there and somebody wanted to use it, they'd have to have a key. So you eliminate the mystery, don't you? It's the person with the key who used the shovel that's missing. In other words, Brown himself. George? Hold it, will you? Yeah, here, Angel. Did you get hold of that taxi driver? Yes. The driver remembered, all right. Now, what's this? Go on, Brooks. He says he drove Mr. Brown out just half an hour before we came. Yoo-hoo! What did she tell you, Mr. Valentine? It's Mr. Brown who found the treasure, oh, all right. Lord. Mr. Brown even paid the driver not to tell anyone he was coming out here. I mean, during the times when he was supposed to be in the city. Today, George, the driver told Mr. Brown all about the excitement here. Over the murder and the treasure and everything. Oh, simply everybody knows now. And he said Mr. Brown suddenly looked very ill. He didn't want to talk about it. He seemed frightened. Then he went in and had a heart attack. Well, that's it. What more do you need? It's been him all along. Yoo-hoo! Mrs. Mercy! She's out there swimming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Brown found the treasure. Poor little Clyde stumbled into what he was doing and... Come here, Mrs. Mercy! 
Mr. Brown will have to tell where the treasure is, naturally. They'll make him, and I guess all the rest of us can okay, just... Okay, okay, we'll all be rich. It's all over with the shouting. Come on, Angel. Yeah, George. What did I say? Oh, I wouldn't worry. What's the matter? Ah, uh, gold makes people do funny things. But I guess there's more than one kind of gold, isn't there? What? She has beautiful hair, doesn't she, Rick? Hmm? Oh, that Mrs. Mercy. Yeah, that's one kind of gold. White bathing suit and all. George, I don't understand. And that. then there's another kind of gold, like Mr. Brown has, the kind in the bank. Oh. Are you trying to say a rich man wouldn't be likely to commit crimes and then be so surreptitious if he'd found a buried treasure? Mm-hmm. But he might be surreptitious about something else. <sighs> Mr. Valentine. Hello. Oh, there, I feel lots better. Water's wonderful. Hello, Mrs. Mercy. Uh... This is the only good place around here to swim, I guess, isn't it? Down here by Mr. Brown's diving platform. Oh, sure. Do it all the time. I'm in training. Uh-huh. Well, when a man is struck several times, when he's fighting for his life, do you think he could be greedy enough to still hang on to a piece of gold? What's that? Oh. Please don't talk about Clyde. Why not? Your third husband who was getting broker and broker. You left him every day, didn't you? To parade in front of the window of the man who would often leave his job to be here. What? Say, what's eating you? The gold coin. Clyde fought for his life. His hand would have been open. The coin would have dropped out. So somebody put it there after he was dead. And certainly that wasn't the one who found the treasure. Why put the finger on himself? So there must have been another motive. I don't get you. All right, take a package being burned in a post office sack. Somebody could drop a cigarette or match and it might burn just the right part of the package. But it would be a lot easier to do the burning first, and then put it there for Miss Gallagher to find to be curious about. Again, there must be a motive. I'm going up to the house. I think you're crazy. Mrs. Mercy, you should have put another shovel in there, so that Mr. Brown wouldn't see his was gone and catch on to what you'd done. Mr. Brown's not here. He's in town. So Mr. Brown wouldn't realize what you were really like, realize you'd murdered your husband, and have a heart attack because of it. No, I didn't. A heart attack? No, he didn't. It's not true. Oh, no. You give yourself away every minute, don't you? Yeah, the lady who killed her husband so she could hook a man with gold. Only, ironically enough, Mr. Brown had a heart attack. Oh, no. <laughs> no! Oh, well, don't worry. Don't worry. He can still marry somebody. But it won't be you. Sure, that's right. He's not dead. You are, sister. But the gold, George, that cup and the coin, the treasure. Oh, there isn't any, Angel, don't you see? Mrs. Mercy just used it to set up a perfect murder. This is Sandy Spit, remember? Just a place for fleas and seagulls. Stick around, I'll prove it. Well, now that we know who bumped off Clyde and why, I still have a question. When is George going to get around to having some of that fish stew he's been yapping about? This I gotta see. Just like this, you've got to hear. <laughs> More, Miss Brooks? Doctor, don't interrupt. Yeah. Well, anyway, Mr. Brown wasn't mixed up in it at all. It was just Mrs. Mercy. He confirmed that finally when he got over the shock of finding out what she was like. You see? Mm, well, go man. on, George. Oh, lobster. Look at that. Pieces of lobster. Right, young man. Whitefish, too. Oh, love whitefish. Yeah, man. But she started the whole treasure fever with an old gold cup and a coin. Mailed the cup. Made sure Miss Gallagher would see it and spread the excitement. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, Gallagher's all right. She's back on the job now. <laughs> uh, pass the bread. Yeah, sure. <laughs> hey, you know, the idea was a good one. With evidence of Clyde having been killed by the person who found the treasure, the police would never think of his wife as the murderess. Seventy-three suspects. A crime blamed on greed. Sure good idea, but it didn't work. Yeah, women should stay where they belong. Isn't that so, Liza? Oh, now, Doctor, stop it. At home, you mean? Yes, I think so, too. Um, I couldn't help noticing you and Miss Gallagher, Doctor. You seem so happy now, so different from when... <laughs> What's that? What's that? Me and who? <laughs> uh, now, don't get any wrong notions, young lady. Valentine here, he understands. Woman's place is in the kitchen. Sure, sure, that's all the Doc wants, Angel. 
You see, I do understand. I'm a fish stew man myself. You have just heard Murder on Vacation, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Our story was by David Victor and Jackson Gillis with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. (laughs) 